Hello, welcome to the Agon slash Paragon uh, actual play. No, that's not it. The Agon slash Paragon <laughs> AMA. <It laughs> Who sounds, knows what'll happen? <laughs> it sounds so similar, right? <laughs> uh ama yeah so uh john and i uh well, well we'll do our introductions but we're gonna we're gonna answer your questions plus a bunch of questions that we had in advance um about agon and the paragon system um i'm sean nittner i uh you see him pronouns you can find me everywhere at sean nittner and uh, i am the uh, co-designer uh of agon uh the second edition the game we just released um, I'm also the uh, director of operations for Evil Hat, and so I see lots of games in their development. Uh, I got to roll, wear two hats for this one, uh, which is great. And uh, just as of very recently, um, created my first Agon uh, Paragon release, Search Protectors, which I'm also excited about. Uh, how about you, John? What's who are you? <laughs> who how would people know you? Oh, I'm you. sure nobody on the stream <laughs> knows who, who John Humber is. Uh, I'm John Harper. I'm a game designer. Um, I co-wrote uh, Agon with Sean and uh, Blades in the Dark. You might know that game as well, um, and other stuff. I can see what show my blades. There we go. Um, <laughs> nice. We're we're very branded today. Yeah, we're very branded. Yeah. Uh, I use he/they pronouns, and um, yeah, the, uh, I, I'm excited to answer questions about Agon and. Um, chat with with sean uh maybe we'll talk about some development stuff too if if we're not uh, answering questions we might just chat a bit too so yeah um, yeah i mean we've got several <laughs> ideas that have been percolating for a long time uh, before we get rolling and everything um our friend max uh shingoya i'm i apologize if i'm mispronouncing your name max max Shing Shingelia, um, is the one who prompted this. Max asked if we would host this AMA, and that's because um, they have a, uh, a new subreddit uh, for Agon. So they're, they're moderating the community. And if folks want to uh, talk about Agon in general, not just in this, uh, you know, in the span of what we're doing, um, while we're doing uh, the AMA, if folks want to chat about it, I will put the link in chat i'll try to there we go and um we'll you know we'll proliferate that out as well um <laughs> my group decided we don't play rpgs anymore we just play john harper games <laughs> i mean there are a lot of cool games out there that john harper didn't make but if you were to say like i'm going to choose one flavor of ice cream for the rest of my life like and that was that was the choice you had to make choosing the john harper flavor of rpg for the rest of your life doesn't sound like a bad bad call to me like play lots of games but you know <laughs> i can't say you're wrong <laughs> uh, well let me know let me know when you've played them all jeff uh and i'll write a new one um, yeah <laughs> there we go if, if you if you run out <laughs> yeah there's a lot there's a lot hidden there's uh john's got a patreon uh, he's got a couple of games there, um, uh, like Thought Lords of Mars. Find, uh, you can find uh, classics like that. Um, and uh, of course, his website, uh, 17, uh, with a bunch of his other good stuff, and his itch page. And we'll, we'll put links like that, but you all know that stuff. That's like yeah. Easy. Um, you want to you wanna dive into Max's questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's start. We'll start there. <clears throat> we're we're, we're going to also try paying attention to the AMA itself, but I've never done it, so hell it's up. If someone puts a question in there and we don't see it, um, be patient, or we'll we'll answer it. We promise. We're just trying to get it in the right place. So his first question, which is funny, because I it's a really interesting perspective. It's 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 not the way I would have asked this question, so I'm, I'm glad he did. Which is, was Agon intended to be reskinned with the Paragon system from the beginning? Or did you just find along the way that it was very naturally adaptable to other game flavors? And then the follow-up question, uh, if it was intended to be reskin, what challenges did you come across in making it this way? Were there mechanics you had to add or remove for the sake of making it cross-compatible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's um, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I don't think we didn't discuss it from the beginning of the re re uh, master or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, for second edition, we didn't really talk about that at all about reskinning or yeah, anything. It wasn't a goal, but we almost <clears throat> immediately started doing it. Like yeah. that was that yeah. was the thing is that we didn't say like oh we want this to be uh, reskinnable. We just like oh we have such Fast and the Furious vibes and you made the ride or die hack, right? And, and uh, we talked about, you know, uh, a Battlestar Galactica level thing and you, you started playing in what I, you know, I only can now assume is effectively Storm Furious. Yeah. You know? um, and- uh, Both of those were directly, like they were during the development process. Yeah. Um, and the same thing happened with Blades in the Dark too, where, you know, I was ha messing with these other hacks yeah. um, while we were writing the core game um, and the changes that were made, some of the tweaks that were made to make the Fast and the Furious one work and then to later on with the Storm Furies one were like, oh, this, this, this like thing I'm playing around with for, for Fast and Furious, that, that could be in the core game. That's like a, a way to do that, that yeah. we might bring back in. So. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what all those things were right now, but but I know that, that during that process we were kind of like stealing things from the hacks and trying them out in the core game, and some of them yeah. stuck and some of them didn't. I think. But. I think one of them that I remember <clears throat> um, was the kind of idea that the trial we were kind of playing with the idea that the game might be GMless, where anyone could sort of just say like, "I want to have a trial of this," um, um, and and or that the island itself would have a few trials and you would kind of hand them out like like handouts and people could pick and choose like uh i'm gonna i'm gonna start this trial and i remember we did that really explicitly uh in ride or die and i, I was running it at a, at a convention and uh it worked really well there because it was in the very small context of a chase um uh, but as we did it more and more it felt like having the like handout kind of ended up distracting people and they were passing around and they felt like that was kind of their limitations and so we ended up kind of moving that more into the strife players purview of like here are some possible trials and here is one trial that you're gonna face in the very beginning no matter what to like kick off the action um, so i think that it really it did help us like figure out um how we present trials uh, which isn't like a hard mechanic but it is very important for the flow of play so yeah yeah, definitely. Uh, that was <clears throat> that was a ongoing thing throughout the development. Was how how can we uh, sort of streamline everything down, especially for the strike player to not have to keep track of a lot of stuff, um, and also to kick things off with each island without it being that really annoying first like hour of most game sessions where you're like okay when are we gonna do the thing uh yeah. so yeah i think i think we were both focused on like what if what if we just wrote them all out ahead of time and handed them to the players or what if we did this or what if we did that yeah. um yeah that speed to action was really important because we wanted an island to be played in a session we really like when we first started play testing it before we like a very very early draft of it i was running a game with um uh, john and nadja and and um, and karen and uh andy and no i'm misremembering i think it was it was yeah it was nadja karen and me i think yeah yeah nadja yeah <clears throat> and, and um it was like th three sessions for the first island um, mm -hmm like two and a half or so yeah and part of that was me because i am sort of prone to pontificate and i'm prone <laughs> to uh, to to belabor things and give everything really time to marinate uh, but also part of it was our resolution and the way we'd kind of jump into the action it, it took there were there were not really smooth on ramps and uh and so we had to fiddle out like is this a contest is it not a contest what kind of contest is it who what what domain are we using um so we really wanted to make that as easy as possible so that the the long-winded strife player like me is just like, oh, wait, no, it says right here. I, we'll just, let's just do that. Let's not, let's not spend too much time. Uh, we have two questions that have come in the AMA. All right. Amazing. Cool. So the first one is, uh, 
Thanks for holding this AMA. I'm really intrigued by the way that you chose to present the license for the engine for Ar Agon, the Paragon system. To summarize for readers, the idea is that we can create skins for Agon. We shouldn't copy all swaths of text. Uh, what is the reasoning for this approach? A quick cynical read would mean this helps funnel more sales towards the original book. Nothing wrong with that. As I've been working on my own playset, however, I've begun to realize the freedom that comes without having to worry about writing an entire rule book, uh, like I would for Forge and Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse Engine. Uh, now that I simply focus on the fun, light cosmetic stuff, but the freedom to jump into grittier mechanics that I want. Curious if that was your intent and any other insight in this, 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 uh, this discussion. This is a very good question. It contains its own answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I feel like, <clears throat> yeah, I feel like, uh, yes, you've got it on both accounts. Uh, I mean, um, one, we definitely want Agon to be a platform um, for future games. We'd like people to be carrying around the book. Uh, whether that's getting a PDF copy off itch, a community copy, uh, a physical copy. Um, it's not, uh, I mean, th there's certainly financial incentives for us to sell the book, no doubt. But uh, the goal is not to make it financially challenging to get to people's hands. It's that we like, we have a good core system here. And as everyone can see, it's really easy to change. Um, so sort of both of those answers sort of feed into one another. Yeah, we want people to use the Agon book, but also that's because exactly what you said. Like John and I have released three Paragon games in the last two weeks, something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. That's not because we had them like planned in advance. I mean, the, like I literally thought of search directors and John did the layout for it and it was made in four days. It was just like, oh, I woke up in the middle of the night and thought, what if Transformers? And uh, and I was able to make it. And um, I know Storm Furies, you had been play testing while we were. Yeah, I had a character sheet and uh... We had we had played a few sessions of it, but um, like putting together the document that it is now, I did that didn't exist. It just like came together, um, and that yeah, I I totally agree with this this poster here. Like um, we do want Agon the book to be the sort of core thing that people um, are are learning the rules from, um, but. Uh, the reason we didn't do the SRD style like blades is it, it is kind of twofold. It's like, um, like you said, like being able to focus on just the cosmetic stuff or the, the one tweak that you need for your thing to work and then just be like, go read this other book. I don't have to deal with that. Um, it does make hacking way simpler and easier. Um, and, you know, I think people who have hacked Forged in the Dark stuff together know that that is a pretty big project and can be like really challenging to do. Yeah. Um, it's also And so we wanted like uh, a, a contrast there. Like, I think it's rewarding and cool to, to make a Forged in the Dark game and use the SRD and like build this like a whole thing that stands on its own. Um, but I, as, as we were getting close towards the end of, of this game and I had already been running these hacks. Uh, Sean and I talked about it and we were kind of like, well, let's not, I don't want to do the same thing again, where it's this thing, this like whole big project for some, for people to hack and, and build up from the ground up. Let's just, let's just have that. It's, it's almost on the level of making a new character sheet is kind of all you have to do to make an Agon hack. And I was like, yeah, if we have an SRD and we have all this stuff, like it's just it's just too much for a game so light and easy um, and simple. So we decided to go that way. And in the future, like who knows, you know, things can change. It's not like a permanent choice. Um, there may could be another standalone Agon powered, you know, Paragon style game in the future as a product or something like I, we're, we're not like this is permanently how it's always going to be but right. like for now we want people to just have fun like making yeah. little light breezy hacks of it and make, make stuff and we, we won't ever rescind these permissions yeah there may be cases where we where we grant more um and yeah. at the at the table what people play with are character sheets and handouts and that's you know you have the book and you reference it depending on the game, you reference it more or less, but hang on, you don't need to reference it that much. Like you get the structure of it, you use the islands from the book, 
you use, you know, you might, for the first, of, course, of course, the first couple times you're doing it, you're going to be using it as reference. But after a while, you're probably just going to be looking at like the last couple pages that just have the sort of game playthrough flowchart. And the, the ephemera that you'll be working with are going to be those character sheets and handouts and stuff like that. And that's what we're sort of inviting people to create, you know, make that stuff. And it's, you know, someone's going to feel like they're playing Storm Fury. So they're not going to be like, I'm playing the, you know, the, the, the space fighter hack of Agon, right? It is that, but it's also Storm Furies because that's what they see. That's what they're, they're going to touch and feel. And those are the dice they're going to roll. So, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, we've got Jeff. Jeff says, what do you consider Agon Paragon? Uh, do you consider Agon Paragon a far ranging blade hack? I can draw a large <laughs> number of parallels. This is a good question. <laughs> I can draw a far number of parallels between them. Uh, examples Agon and Agon Trial is like a blades group action. Spending a bond is like an assist. Supporting is like a setup action. Pathos is like stress. And spending one gets you the equivalent of pushing yourself. Is that where you started? I don't, I wouldn't say it's where we started. Agon First Edition existed and we had <clears> a lot of forward momentum from that but yeah we certainly borrowed from plates <laughs> <laughs> well it's funny because it was like we did start with first edition um and kind of like a cleaned up uh like a fixed version of first edition jason morningstar uh did that um and we were like great like because jason played way more first edition agon than both of us come well more than me maybe not more than sean but definitely more than Pro me. probably probably more than both um, us, yeah. <clears throat> so he really understood it and and did a, a great fixed cleaned up version of it um and then when we when we played it like our both of our design sensibilities have changed a lot and we were like Ugh, <laughs> i don't like this <laughs> And not because it was bad. It was just like, I, this isn't the type of game I really like anymore. Um, yeah. So uh, we kind of realized like, well, we're going to have to just do it, do it over. But it was like a process of, you know, a ship of Theseus kind of thing. Like we're just taking stuff off and putting stuff on until eventually like it wasn't the thing anymore. But we didn't start out and with the goal like, okay, let's build off the blade structure. Yeah. It was just like, that's where our design sensibilities are and so i think we we went in that direction but a lot of those mechanics in some form were were in first edition uh so it's it, i guess in some ways you could think of it like blades being influenced by Ag first edition agon um yeah. i probably had certain things in my mind from that design that went into blades and then or went into danger patrol and then went into blades or you know whatever however that process works um that's that's the best thing about bad game ideas is that if you have an idea that doesn't work for a game, just like shelve it away somewhere, noodle it, you know, put it in a notebook, forget about it, remember it ten years later because it might work in another game. And Agon had a lot of, you know, I had this other idea for another game that we didn't implement. It won't work exactly, but we, maybe we could do a little bit of it uh, here. Um, and there were a lot of things that went from. Uh, I think kind of generic to more specific by way of that line of thinking. Like originally in first edition Agon, you just had um, your return home chart. And so we kind of just took that over. We're like, yeah, you return home, you have a chart. Once you fill it up, you get home. And, and that was cool. And like, it was a cool tracker to show you how you're getting there. And uh, somewhere along the lines, we realized like, oh, but what if we had like specific, we started talking about specific favor or wrath of certain gods. And we started like thinking about the way that characters like Skurlock or like, like Dremor or like canonically known NPCs, like how well, how much they influence the game. And it's a lot of it's like how much their presence is in the game. And that was part of the change to the vault of heaven where now it's not, do you like get enough aggregate God approval overall? It's do you get you know, three or five of the gods to light your way home. And if you do, that's enough. And you can have Hera loving you and Zeus pissed off at you and Athena, you know, giving you a pass. Um, so I, I feel like we took some ideas from various things and they really refined bits of Agon. Yeah. Um, I, there, there was a moment, I forget exactly, um, 
when we were revising how you spent um, pathos and divine favor because mm. uh, it used bunch. to be it, yeah it used to be like really annoying um, you could do stuff after the roll uh, and like that would change the ordering of people and then someone else would be like well now that I'm down here I'm going to spin too and, and like you're just like ah there are like six different ways to spin stuff and there was some moment during at one of our design discussions um, where some one of us proposed the uh, you know spend just spend ahead of time and like burn burn let's just burn pathos for for a, an advantage and um, <laughs> and one of us acknowledged I forget yeah, but I had this vague memory of someone going like yeah that blades in the dark game that's uh, <laughs> maybe we should steal from that <laughs> and we didn't do it on purpose it was just like. We yeah. just re realized after the fact that we had found that solution, which, um, and and it, it the game needed that solution. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like let's make it like blades. It was yeah, that we were trying it, to cram a blades thing in. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but one of the like we had these moments where you'd like roll a six and then you could spend divine favor and you could explode or you roll the max on a die and you spend divine favor and you explode it. And we had these moments that. Um, were like really exciting because that like oh, maybe we're gonna make it but then we had far more moments where we're like oh that actually ruined the tension of the, the whole thing like one person's like yeah i won and then someone else is like oh wait i spent much enough time to find favor now i won and they're like <laughs> looking at each other like you jerk like why did you just steal this thing from me and sometimes that's done in like really fun sort of in the spirit of the game but sometimes it was just like oh man what a what a buzzkill and we also felt like if you only spent things as you needed them, then there, the, the, the interesting like risk elements weren't there. You're like, I really want to, I really want to be best in this. So I'm going to throw everything I've got at it. Maybe I don't need that. Maybe I win by a landslide or maybe I fail anyway, but um, I'm deciding in advance what to invest. And so those, those themes of like the gameplay, like how the gameplay would work and also like how we wanted people to approach a contest, they just kind of, yeah, like John said, they demanded that style of uh, uh, th th that, that sort of mechanics where you're investing in advance. And, uh, and yeah, so hence it looked kind of like Blades in that way. <laughs> but yeah, it, it wasn't until it all was kind of done and the pieces fit together and we had play tested and, 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 and Sean put up with me going, I have to change everything again. <laughs> like, there were several times during the development where I did that and I was like, ah. Oh. I have to trade everything. It was so um, funny because John and I would play a game and we'd be like, Jeff's kiss. This is it. This game is perfect. And then, and I don't think, I mean, you, you definitely made the biggest changes, but I had a few as well where I kind of came back and was like, nah, is, this ain't it. Um, there were a few times when like the, the whole players having two dice at the end, that was kind of a late development when we were mm -hmm. trying to figure out you know, take your highest die and, 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 and all those things. And, um, but yeah, there were, there were several times where we were just like, oh, we played a couple of games and we're like, that is the perfect game. It, it, every high note we want. And then we take it somewhere else and someone would just like do stuff. We're like, oh, that was terrible. Someone <laughs> just lapped someone else in glory three times and like got their name die up. Someone just, you know, um, made this one contest take half an hour because they kept belaboring it by adding in another contest to change what kind of contest it would be. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there's lots of, oh, sorry, we got to tear this all down and start again. I think we called it, we think we called the release version, version 13. I think, that's, I think, I think so. Yeah. And it's legit 13 versions. Like there mm -hmm. were 13 games, well, 12 games in there because we started one version two, you know. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's uh, edition. <laughs> so it was after all of that, after it, it, we, it had each part had gotten worked on and it was like done, done. That uh, it was after at that point where we were looking at it and going like, wow, yeah, this. There are a lot of like similar components that look kind of like Blades in the Dark or some Danger Patrol stuff too, um, but yeah, it wasn't. We did not set out to do that. It 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 got the solutions it needed along the way. Uh, Jeff says, side note, Sean, I've been enjoying your content on, on your APs and your play reports. Uh, and it was a pleasure to see your name besides John on this card cover. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, it was 
a pleasure working with John on making this game. It's... It was so much fun that, you know, we kind of didn't want to be done with it in a way. <laughs> we, <laughs> we had a blast working on it. We finished it and then we're kind of like, we kind of like left the door open, like ride or die, storm furious, um, uh-huh. other things. <laughs> so we've already got a couple other things that we probably won't talk about today because they're not developed enough to talk about. But um, you know, we've got a, yeah. we've got a got a couple more things uh, in the, in the hopper. Uh, all right, I've got a question from from the AMA from Stone Arch Bridge Troll. Uh, what do you think makes a better and what do you think makes an idea better for Paragon rather than Forge in the Dark? For example, what made Search Directors a good choice for Paragon rather than something closer to Forge in the Dark? I kind of feel like we answered this with the last question, honestly, but I think it's a lot of it is like how much work you want to do and how well something maps to one style of play versus the other. You know, um, Blades is really good for teamwork based missions, which is not quite the same as you know, legendary heroes competing to be the best as they overcome things. There's definitely overlap, there's definitely similarities, but um, I think if you, but I mean, the biggest thing I would say is like, do you want to be able to make it in a week, a month, or do you want to spend two or three years doing it? Because <laughs> right now that's, that's about the scale I'd normally say is the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, also, I think it's a little, it's a false dichotomy here, right? Like, it's, you don't just choose between a Forged game or a Paragon game. Like, yeah. there's any format for a game. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to say why a given game is a fit for, for whatever it ultimately is. There's no, there's no ideal form that something can take, it's just going to be, different depending like it could be fate but you know uh search protectors would be a perfectly great fate uh world um yeah but uh i I, i'd say probably paragon hacks are easier than fate it's close fate's very easy to hack so i mean i I think we made like 50 or so fate worlds and they took about nine months to go from writing through system development, through editing, through layout, through art. Um, the Paragon games that have come out so far have a bit of a, 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 a shortcut in that, John, you are an amazing illustrator and graphic designer and layout artist, and that you design in layout. So when you're done with the game, you're kind of done with the product at the same time, which yeah. is you know, in the fate development line, not the case. You know, We would, someone would write a piece of text and. Uh, also, we would take people that weren't super familiar with Fate and sort of that was a, a, a line where we were trying to introduce folks to it. So we'd pair them with the system developer. So it like kind of de- depending on where you are in your development process, I think one is, um, you know, any of those systems, yeah, are, are fairly approachable and the amount of work you can put into them kind of depends on how much you want to get out of it. But yes, you could absolutely be like, we're going to play the Transformers Fate game have an aspect about your machine form, right? Have yep. have have skills and stunts that are about transforming and lasers and power cores and you know, and and you're good to go. Uh, yeah, I think it, it, they're all going to have different feels to them. Um, they're going to play differently at the table, so you you take all those things into consideration, but. Um, for Paragon stuff, I think one of the primary, the, the two primary motivators for making Paragon hack are, um, I like the way that the Agon system handles and feels in play. Uh, and I want my thing to have that handling and feel. Uh, and then uh, I've got, you know, a couple days to, <laughs> to work on something. So um, I'll do this, this will be easy. Um, I think those are the, the main reasons uh, to, do a Paragon game. My uh, my Twitch chat is not functioning anymore, so oh. hopefully yours is, Sean. You can still see questions. Uh, I do. I can. Okay, um, good. Uh, I see. Um, I see. Last one I have, at least that I see, is Corey saying uh, "Laughing Glory" three times. Oh no! Yes, that, was, <laughs> that wasn't. Oh no. 
Uh, was I, yeah, that was a bad system. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was funny because it was like one of those those times when it was like there was a lot of cool things in that game, and you kind of still resist. You're like, well, was that a fluke? But like, no, we just we can't allow for that to happen. So we did. Um, uh, and and to, to the point of that, it was at the end of an island, somebody's glory, whoever has the most glory, um, advances their name die and then set, resets their glory to zero. And that's super cool. It seems really elegant and close, but- Yeah, it was like the winner of the island. Yeah, um, it was like the winner of the island. But if someone did really poorly, they could walk out of the island with like three glory. And so they could get lapped that by the same person. And uh, that was bad. It was bad. It was bad. So now yeah. we, we made a sort of more fixed thing. All right, we've got more questions in on the AMA. Uh, I'm still responding to this one. I knew this was going to be the issue. I was going to try and talk and type, and, and <laughs> there it goes. I, I'll, I'll, for everybody in the AMA, thank you for your 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 your, your patience. Um, uh, so next question is, what are the best tips for a first time strike player? Also, thanks for the quick response on the bookmark thing. Oh, yeah. Somebody asked about bookmarks. Today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a drive through for some reason, but we got it fixed. Best tips for a first time strike player are in the book. Uh, I would read that. Um, that's, that, that's, that's, my, that's my whole answer. <laughs> I was like, cool, John will answer this one, and I'll have some time to type the answer to the last question. <laughs> Sorry. No, uh, okay. While you're typing, I can talk, say a little more about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Why do you expand on that a little more? Uh, it was a goal. It was a goal for um, for Agon um, as we started, uh, a after we started uh, working on it. Um, it started to look like uh, being the strike player maybe wasn't going to be too tricky. Um, and so I thought, well, this could be a good like starter game for people who haven't uh, been a GM before. And so I want to try to write a guide to being a GM that is very short and not overwhelming. Um, and is about running Agon, but also kind of is sort of a primer on just how to GM a, a lot of games. Um, so it was a process of like getting that down to those three spreads, uh, which is like, you know, two regular eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper worth of, worth of text. Like this is all, this is all the stuff you need to know. Um, <clears throat> actually it's probably more like one page really uh, yeah. in terms of word count. And um, that distillation process was a big, chunk of of the work um to get it down into that form and then really like think about it like is this really what you need to know uh so yeah i think i certainly don't have better tips to say right here on an ama stream than i had in working on that for months <laughs> yeah so you said, um, <laughs> we spent uh we spent a, a year or or two uh uh two for sure yeah, uh, draft, you know, we're finding those. Yeah. I'm just letting my little doggy free. I discovered someone was home. <laughs> Damn it. Needed, needed to go. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, but friends, hey, Butopian, good to see you. Silly question uh, What drink and food pairs best with Agon in each Paragon game? <laughs> It's not a silly question. I think it's a very, very germane question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'd want something kind of frothy and cr or crisp for, uh, I'm not a much of a beer drinker, but I would definitely play Agon to a stout or a cider. I feel like those are both, uh, I don't think that those are like, I mean, I'm not trying to be like historically accurate. This that's just like a mood thing, not like a well, I would drink mead from a horn. Uh, although I think you would want wine, right? I mean, if it was really like exactly historical. right. If we're um, going really historical, you 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 be drinking wine, but for wine me, with yeah. with some uh, clay uh, clay bowls to drink from. I think that's mm -hmm. maybe accurate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think? What's your favorite? Uh, I mean, honestly, I'm just gonna probably drink whiskey. Like that's if I'm being real about it. But that's not. 
particularly pairing to the game. <laughs> That's <laughs> usually what we're going to drink when we're, for gaming, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm sure Allison would be able to answer this question better, I think, but um, yeah, yeah uh, I think we've, we've played with like cheese, cheeses and, and uh, figs uh, and, and various drinks like that, um, uh, that go with that. Um, seems like a good, a good pairing to me. Um, for, uh, for the other ones though, I don't know. I haven't really thought about, I guess, yeah, for Storm Furies, I guess it probably is like whiskey and beer and smoke cigars and <laughs> like, like you're in the, the, the ready room, um, for yeah. the pilots. Yeah, I think for like I I never drink soda anymore. Um, in mostly just because my dad just has told me that like if I do my teeth will all just immediately fall out. Like if Coca Cola touches my lips, it's all gone. Um, so I, I I only drink like sodas very few and far between. But like I think like yeah like Cheetos and Coca Cola uh, or a bowl of cereal would be the right thing to place to, to eat while <laughs> bowl of honey honey nut. Uh, would be perfect for playing search tractors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. But thank you. Um, yeah, Batopian, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, going back to, I'm still one behind. That's okay. I can, I can keep playing catch up. Going back to, uh, to um, Reddit. Uh, Gloomy Emphasis says, I'm thinking about using the Paragon system for an element, uh, for element bending like Avatar. I love the idea of all your dice representing your, your stats and the player having to interpret the dice. Okay. Question, how fast did the name Paragon come to mind? Uh, how would you get a non-DM player to get, how would you get a non-DM player to get to play the Strife player? Uh, the name Paragon took a while to emerge. Um, we almost put a like system branding thing on the Agon book when it was going to press, like like the day <laughs> I was sending the files to the printer. We were um, like th this version with the, the imprint, this version without. Like we were. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't Paragon. Um, and. I, I, I put it on and was like, yeah. And then I don't know, like an hour later or something, it was like, I don't, I don't think this is good. I, no, we have to take this off. <laughs> so I took it off and redid the, the cover file. Um, and we just decided ah, if we do it down the road, that's fine. It, 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 it'll be whatever it ends up being. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, Paragon, it was pretty recently um, that it, that it popped into my head and, um, yeah, it's convenient <laughs> that it just kind of has that um, little little cute uh, little connection. Cute um, encapsulation there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's it, it's we we've <laughs> talked about doing it. You know, probably probably for you know at least six to eight months. Um, but. Um, but but not continuously, you know. We're like, yeah, we should do this, and then it kind of dropped. And um, and I think it was it was probably we were talking about like what could we release in the form of something that would be hackable, and that's kind of the impetus. We were like, well, we got to call it something. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and John just sort of like drops down. He's like, why? What do you think about this? And he's like here's chamber and i'm like this is amazing <laughs> this, is, this is phenomenal oh paragon oh yeah yeah absolutely but yeah, yeah i felt like it had it, it needed to be both um just to to get the ball rolling there instead of being like hey we have this you can hack this here's a logo thing for it um i was like yeah we need to provide an example and um at the same time so those, those were done at the, together. I, the Paragon thing kind of waited until the chamber stuff was finished so we could announce it. But, um, and how would you get a non-DM player to play the Strife player? I, I wouldn't get someone to do anything. I think, you know, give them the book and, and if, if they read it and they're excited about being the Strife player, then they should be. And if they're not, then, then don't. Um, 
you might say at the start when you're putting your group together, like, I think it'd be fun to have revolving strife players. So like we'll each run an island and we we'll each have a hero to play and we'll like round robin. Um, and if everyone's like, no, that sounds terrible, then too, too bad. <laughs> You're not going to do that. Uh, but bringing it up at the beginning uh, as a setting an expectation and, and just floating it to the group might be good. It's lower pressure. You don't have to like be the GM for the whole time. You just have to run one island or, you know, it's a little lower um, stakes. So that might help someone feel more comfortable to, yeah. to try it out. I think you can do a couple um, light uh, offers as well. Like um, everybody can make players and everybody can make characters in the beginning. Like the strife players are like, I'm gonna make character, you know, my character's with you as well. So you kind of have that sense of like, we're a bigger band than maybe it's just the players who are active. Uh, kind of a, a little bit like a West Marches style of like, well, you're the people who are playing, so you're the heroes on this adventure, but that's not necessarily always the case. So you kind of leave that door open. Um, and also when you're done with an island, you know, if someone's really excited and they're like, oh, I have a cool idea for an island of their own, or they're like, you know, they, they seem like they're inclined to it. It's very easy to sort of, you know, pass the, the torch as it were. There's nothing really stopping you from, I mean, it's, it's, it's intended in the game that, it's, that you're able to shift life players. But I mean, I think I would look at, at people's excitement and interest. And if they feel like, if they seem like they're, they're jazzed about it, then yeah, give them, hand them, hand them the, the tome, the dice. Um, yeah. Uh, Ghost Court is one of my favorite games for doing this. It's a silly LARP about ghosts and the dead and the, and the, and the, and the, and the not dead, not yet dead suing each other over civil claims and everybody's role in that game is totally permeable and so one of my favorite things is whenever you start the game you often start as the judge because it kind of like kicks the game off but like once someone's seen you be the judge once or twice it's really easy to see that you're just up there bsing you're not really doing anything uh and so then you can be like anyone want to play the judge um i don't think tabletop rpgs necessarily transition as quick as easy but i i like to look at that model and think like you know show it off Let's people see what being a strike player is like and then see if they're want to want a shot at it. Um, we have another question on Reddit, uh, which is um, any design tips for designing a more extensive Paragon playset? Star Furies, haha, ha, that's funny. I, I made that mistake myself, uh, calling it Star Furies. I think my itch page said Star Furies for all. Sean like, caught it and was like, this isn't what it's called. <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's what you meant to call this. But yeah, I, I make that mistake too. Um, Storm Fury showed that playsets can stray quite far from Agon. Um, how much playtesting did you do for your individual playsets, or did you just rely on the playtesting you did for Agon? Um, yeah, I. Storm Furies is fairly different, um, like in in a few key ways. Uh, the the contests and the like conflict resolution stuff is the same, but um, the way you know that you're kind of like getting resources for your for your carrier and um, uh, the way that the the NPCs are like in peril. Um, so some of that stuff is is different from core agon but uh we i we play tested storm furies like i think we played maybe four sessions maybe maybe a little more than that um during the development of agon uh and just tried out some different things just just to experiment um, back then but then the for the version that was released i kind of went back and it, it, it had some legacy stuff from older versions of, of Agon, so it had to kind of be like brought up to the current version and then changed. Um, so it took it took a little, uh, you know, tinkering to get some of that. And and um, the expressions, which are kind of the strangest change, um, having your like legendary virtues uh, that are kind of more gameable, you know, they're kind of like give you a thing to, to spend. I saw um, it and I was like, damn it, why didn't we think of that for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it would totally work in regular Agon too. I don't think it the game needs it to be like that, but um uh because the, 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 the way the, the, the divine favor works is is good in core Agon. But 
in Storm Furies, I needed like one more place for you to get a divine favor thing. And so that that was a good a good way to do it. But that that was not play tested. Um, we I, it was in the game in the la the last session that we that we played. Uh, but it didn't, you know, we, we did, we did it at the end of the session and then we didn't play another one. So, um, hopefully that system works well. Um, but yeah, chamber, um, is very, it's like the same. Um, it doesn't really have any mechanical changes really. So, uh, I just relied on the Agon play testing for that. Um, and same with search protectors. Uh, no, yep. no play testing on that one. Yeah, yeah. My, my goal with search tractors was to make the. It's so stupid to uh, not stupid. It's silly to think of it this way, but I really thought of search tractors as the first iteration of search tractors is literally just going to be an agon reskin, and then the, where I'm going to start doing, like actual like mechanical game development is in the incursions themselves, where each one, not each one, some of them, um, will have rules for modifying the game after the complete. Uh, and one of the initial ones, you know, one of the players can get cut off from the metal warp dimension they can be locked out on earth and lose their resistance die until they can go back to metal warp to get it that like it's like a whole quest to restore that um but there's um there's a an at an add-on called inc incursions unlocked which is 70 80 percent done right now maybe more i'm gonna hope to release it today after this where there's like three new incursions that allow you to do different things like join the photons and be one of the be a rock star that has a metal warp instrument or return to metal warp and make attacks on a giant moon size base you know uh so so there's all sorts of uh ways that i'm expanding it but i'm doing it by incursion rather than making it core so that way if i do anything and it messes it up i can be like cool we'll just scrap that incursion we'll change that way that one works and it's this way to like try like bolt on techniques rather than building them core. um sort of experimenting yeah i think that's a really cool way to do it um to have like incursion based or island based or whatever mi mission based um mechanics to tinker with things and i think oh boy i am gonna not remember this designer's name right now but um do i have it open somewhere uh this person made three new islands in this in this little island set that they published on itch um I don't have it open in front of me right now, sadly. Um, but they're really good, and uh, I'm gonna—I'll I'll try to find it, and maybe we can include a link. Um, but uh, one of the islands is these like Icarus racers. These people—they all—they have these like custom wax wings, and they're like all racing around these cliff tops. Uh, cool. um, and so there's like you know the race is like a thing when you go to that island you have to like do the race game um so yeah uh, I, I think all of all of his islands have um have like a gimmick like that uh that introduces like a it's, it's not really mechanically uh iterating but um it's it's like focusing the the game in that direction or, or the 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 uh, rhapsodic island the rap battle island um yeah. is like that too it has a kind of take on how the mechanics work that puts it in a different oh hey sam <laughs> you're in chat awesome <laughs> hey, sam. Yes. sorry sorry for forgetting your name uh your islands are awesome um yeah sam dunwald uh d-u-n-n-e-w-o-l-d uh i think you can find um that stuff on itch uh, using that information um yeah very 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 cool islands um, Stone Arch Bridge Troll. Oh, that's you. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, yeah, uh, and and um, uh, the first Rider Die stuff was like that too. They were kind of these um, not mini games exactly, but uh, the trials were uh, presented as like this is the trial where you have to race out of uh, the Hell World. And it has these like specific, you know, components to it. Um, and this is the trial where you're at the club and you're like trying to make a scene for your crew. And like um, most of that stuff got got kind of streamlined down so that 
when we present trials in the core book, they're, they're, um, the strike player doesn't have to be like, how does this one work? What's the special mechanic for this? Um, it just kind of gives you the, the, the situation and then the system is always the same system. Um, but yeah, I think having custom stuff in, on islands or in incursions or, or missions or whatever is a really good place to, to tinker. Um, Cause like Sean said, like if something doesn't work, like, well, that it's, that that's over, <laughs> it's left behind. We're moving on to the next thing now. Right. Um, it's not a permanent change that, that you have to like deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, if you really like a thing, cool, try getting the core, you know, make, make it, some, make it, make it a core thing, but, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. Well, we'll see. That's an experiment. You know, we'll see if people are playing surf tractors and if, if they do it and see what people, uh, see people uh, how the Icarus racers on Sam's Island uh, uh, enjoy that. I'm really excited about people making additional islands. I knew that when we put out Paragon, people would definitely flock towards making their own settings, which is cool. I mean, do it. But I also love um, when people, you know, that was one of the other reasons why we wanted to be able to do it, is if you were playing Agon, we, we put 12 islands in the book, which were like 12 islands, that's plenty. But if you play them and you want new ones, you know, there's eight more that are stretch goals. And so there's 20 islands. Okay, that's plenty, but maybe not. Maybe you want more. So I'm, 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 thank you, Sam, for making it 23. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's another, um, at least one uh, Agon like style island um, that somebody else made. And I think it's on the forum. Um, yeah. So I've got one yeah. more that I haven't released. People will see True. it. Okay. Yeah, it's cool too. We're at the, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> we have secret plans. Sorry, everybody, for being vague, but um, there's there's more stuff coming. Um, uh, All right. Another Reddit question. Um, Did we just talk about any design tips for making? Design? Oh, I guess not. For not really, for making a more extensive yeah. uh, playset. Uh, I guess. Um, I would play, uh, play and iterate. If if it's straying from the Agon core, um, you you can't necessarily rely on our playtesting and development anymore. So, um, if you're doing something, changing up, up, up things up a lot or changing up the situation or how characters work or whatever, um, I that, I think that's just good practice. Like get a group together, play play and iterate, and and see how it works at the table. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Um, there was definitely times where we would get stuck in development, and every time we were like, eh, we weren't making progress, or we weren't, we weren't. You know, any, any time I felt like we were getting stuck, the answer I think almost every time was play. Uh, almost every time it was let's play a game and see what happens, and we'll know. And sometimes that was together, and sometimes that was. Um, you know, off in our in our own spaces. John would run a game for somebody, I'd run a game somewhere. Um, and we'd kind of come back and say, yeah, this worked and that didn't. Um, I remember playing a bunch of it uh, at cons and it was great because I'd get new people every time. And so we just got this like great sense of like, these people got it immediately and these, you know, someone struggled with this. Um, but we kept testing out new versions. And so we'd get, you know, lots and lots of feedback and that was just the best way to not only determine whether the game worked but also just like convince like keep us excited about it i don't know i get i don't get i lose excitement about a game if i don't play it <laughs> for me at least <laughs> yeah yeah for sure that helped a lot uh you want to read the next uh next one there um, sure Deepling. uh Deepling says i'm thinking of using the paragon engine for an engine of the fate franchise in the show the fate friend i don't know what the fate franchise is um yeah. in the show characters get three command seals that make them some nearly impossible feats possible in terms of balancing if i were to change the divine favor to a maximum of three slots but bump the die size to d12 would that work or would that feel too unbalanced um I think I know what you mean. So uh, it, in, in this show, um, uh, uh, oh, it's an uh, anime series. Okay. Saying, yeah. 
um, in the show, these characters are like really powerful or something. Maybe um, I per personally, I wouldn't. I, I think having a D twelve divine favor die would be really swingy and and also like kind of it just would like kind of obliterate people the rest of the dice sometimes it kind of wouldn't matter what what you had rolled yeah. um I, I i would just for my own design sensibilities i would tend to just kind of keep this mechanic the same and change the meaning of it uh and just say like you know you have your d6s and your domains and your d8 uh specialty and you have your divine favor dice and stuff to add but what we're doing in the fiction is like knocking down a mountain. Um, and that's what, that's how our character's power level is understood. And when we have contests, like we might be drinking an ocean or whatever, but like, we're still just the, the, the dice don't need to be bigger or, or whatever in order to do that, that you can just sort of change the meaning of, of, um, of what your character stats mean. You yeah. Know? And what's um, at stake. And I remember in yeah. a, a play test we were having, John, I was like, um, I want to jump down this hole to the bottom of the earth and talk to Kronos and have a conversation with uh, with the god that that uh, this woman is trying to set free. And uh, and, and you were just like, uh, OK, right. You know, it was like because I was like a creation of Hephaestus and I had I was made of metal and stone. And so I just like fell through the earth because there's a big hole. Um, uh yeah i think it was like you know, you know burn burn your pathos up front to 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 suffer you know this this titanic fall and and find the underworld and um you know the stakes were really high yeah. <laughs> to and like talk going, to this titan and stuff right and it was it was it was super dangerous because it was yeah the stakes were things that were like you know uh, upturn the earth right but the mechanically we didn't change anything really um or mechanically we just sort of used the the tools that, that we still had and i think um yeah having a higher outcome in a die roll doesn't really ever you know i think capture the the sense of um epicness or mythic uh, action that you that you want you know a D, &D character can roll like a, a nat 20 and still like do two points of damage to the dragon and feel like that's nothing in in paragon if you succeed and best the dragon like you've got it in a headlock or you've trapped it in a magic net or you know <laughs> you 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 or you slain it with your sword whatever that may be right it's, it's yeah uh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter what the die roll ends up as is more as the action you're narrating yeah yeah i mean having said that like like we said before about doing hacks and, and play testing and stuff like it, it if you have a group that's willing to try stuff and you know you can just just try it out like be like okay we're gonna have d12 divine favor dice and like just see maybe it maybe it's great um i i my gut feeling is that that's not the solution but if you have a group who's willing to play test and try stuff out and tweak things like get give, give it a shot try it for one conflict or try it for a session or whatever and and just uh, play around with it. Um, that's that's assuming you have a group that's that's willing to do that. Um, and if not, you can try it on your own too. Set up some characters and contests and try it out on your own. But um, we use uh, John as particularly, but both of us use any dice quite a bit um, to kind of figure out probabilities. Um, Anydice.com, I believe, is I think so. the URL. Um, really great dice maths visualizer um you can run a bunch of stats on how your dice work uh, yeah and, and uh yeah we did a, <laughs> i had like so many uh i kept sending sean like okay here's the new here's the new any dice curves yeah. for the for the changes go, go and look <laughs> at these it totally felt like a like like we had real jobs and, and and that we were like here's the tps reports you know <laughs> on the new strife curves because um, uh -huh. it used to be the strife player would roll multiple dice and keep well, everybody just rolled one die and kept the highest and then it was like both the strife player and the players roll two dice and keep the highest and we just found that the strife player was like far too swingy and so the introduction of the strife level which actually came kind of later on was to reduce some of that swinginess, was to say the strife player is never gonna 
you're never going to have a challenge with like a two that you couldn't fail because two dice, if you even if you rolled all ones, you know, you'd still succeed. There's no, we're never going to have that challenge. Um, uh, the lowest you're going to have, you know, the beginning is a six, right? And, and yeah. that, that then means, okay, you know, um, you need to, you need to decide how much effort you want to apply. Um, and, uh, and that all just came from any dice. Like we just kept looking at any dice and be like, how do we, how do we get this band of challenge rating that is exciting and compelling to get people to, to put their resources into, but doesn't, isn't so swingy. And uh, yeah. What do you yeah. know? Having a fixed number makes things less swingy. Well, yeah. I, well, I actually argued for, for having a fixed obstacle numbers um, period and no, no dice for the strife player, because that's obviously the, the neatest solution to the problem is to just have this, the randomness on one side um, and arguably like a, a sort of like smarter game design decision um, to, to have a fixed number and then the the rolling is compared to that when you roll on both sides it just creates all this chaos in the in the stats um, like the way that things play out and I was like oh duh like why am I why are we doing this uh, let's just give the strike player like fixed target numbers and um, the players roll against those and <laughs> Sean was like no <laughs> <laughs> I want to roll dice. <laughs> I like rolling dice. Don't take my dice away. <laughs> yeah, I really did. I was really oh. like, I was really jealous of those of those dice, and did not really <laughs> give them up. Um, and and it turned out, I mean, that that was the right decision. Like, it means something in the game, even though st dice stats wise, things are uh, some things are like not as significant as they might seem, but it does mean something in play to to pick up those two d10s for the serpent of nemos or whatever instead of that d6 and the players go oh yeah yeah okay yeah. this is serious um it just it feels different than saying it's a 15 or whatever there's just something about the the dice that um add added to the kind of aesthetic um fun factor uh, so and and people don't um people don't quite get this as much when you're playing online and it, it, it's a bummer, but one thing that uh, is part of the ritual of the game is naming the dice that you're picking up. You know, I'm picking up my D6 name die and I'm picking up my D6 epithet and I'm picking up my D8 craft and reason and I'm adding in my D4 divine favor from Athena and I've got this big pool and the idea is that everyone kind of does that simultaneously so you can kind of see like oh you're you're, you're really good for it are you okay um you know here i'm going to support you i'm going to give you more dice or no i'm going to i'm going to spend all my resources and try and best you and uh the same goes for the strife player a strife player can be like the serpent of nemos d10 with his scintillating scales I, i'm going to get the dice wrong if i try to do it from memory but you know <laughs> you you call out their various attributes and the players are all watching you build this die pool um the hero players are all watching the strike players build this die pool and you get the sense of how dangerous this particular spider is versus you're like eh the town guard and you pick up 2d6 and it's like eh, you know they're there they're 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 <laughs> gonna they're gonna try and stop you they're probably not gonna succeed <laughs> yeah well somebody on uh, in the twitch chat um asked Speaking of that example, Sean, um, do you have any thoughts on improvising obstacles, like picking a die size for contesting a mountain climb or whatever? Um, and I think, I mean, there's, because of the way we did the islands, we've given you 50 example um, obstacle die values uh, to draw to draw on. So in a sense, there's kind of like a really extensive um, obstacles list in the book yeah. from from the 2d6 guards to the uh fight contesting the gods themselves in kakoni yeah i think yeah. it's 4d12 or something yeah. like that um so there the range is it is in the book it's not presented as a table of obstacle uh, like values but um I, and pretty much any given island too if you just go to uh, go to an island that, that'll have that range. Um, most of the islands have a range from like kind of normal people to like very significant, like a, a Titanic monster or a, something like that. Um, so that, but again, like 
when you're improvising, I don't know why I said again, <laughs> um, when you're improvising a, an obstacle um, that's just, you know, come out of nowhere. Uh, it, I mean, it's not written in the, in the island. It's something that's like coming out of the fiction in the moment. Um, the, there's no, there's no such thing as like the appropriate difficulty number for, for a thing. Um, the way there is in, in some other games where you kind of want to be consistent and like, wait, last time we climbed this, you know, 20 foot tall thing, it was DC 11 or whatever. Like, why is it DC 20 now? Right. Um, in Agon, the, the strife players die sizes and the strife level is how much glory the, the, the contest is worth. So that's a kind of a better way to think of it. Like this treacherous mountain climb, the heroes just do it. You're at the top of the mountain now. Or wait, is this like the mountain no one's ever climbed? Yeah. Like, oh, well, that's worth glory, obviously, then. Like, it has to, we have to roll for that. Um, and how glorious is it to get to the top of this thing? Is it, to, is it 40 12? <laughs> um, right. Are the gods literally throwing lightning bolts from the sky to stop us from making it up? Or, yeah. Um, you know, is, is, is Poseidon shaking the earth to, to try and fling you from the mountain? Um, in, in, in Brachoy, which used to be Perry Siroy uh, <laughs> which was probably the island I iterated the most because yeah. I never oh. quite get it right. So many versions, yeah. Uh, and I, I, it was one of those things where it was like a, a, a heart, fantasy heartbreaker, sort of, or just, just a heartbreaker, I guess, because like I had this idea of what I wanted it to be and I could not articulate it for the longest time. But, um, you know, Ares, Ares is actively trying to get these sort of contestants to fight and running up to the top of the hill to claim his cloak, uh, which I don't even, which I think is still in the current version. I've iterated it so many times I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's a foot race to the top of the hill, but it's a foot race where Ares wants to test the metal of, of the people going up there. So the challenge there is really hard because there's, there's literally a god involved in trying to make it more difficult. They want to see who is the best among you. Um, that would absolutely not be the case if it was a windy day and you were just trying to run up the hill, right? You know, um, yeah, we, we, you know, and so, yeah, I think it's a lot about what, what you envision is like, how, what people would say about this afterwards. Like, oh, you're, no one's ever climbed that before. That, that, that's one of our, both John and I's favorite lines to do is say like, you know, the shield that's never been broken, the sword that's, the, the, the pirate who's never been caught on the, op on the, on the seas, you know, um, the more you uh, kind of frame things in impossibility, the more unreasonable it is to, um, to, 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 to bump up those dice or to make it a contest at all. Um, uh, I think John has stepped away for a second, but that is all good. I will continue, I'll continue uh, vamping here. Um, question, uh, were the design goals beyond you roll and keep to uh, from the dice pool you create Nagon? What were the design goals beyond you roll and keep to from the dice pools you create Nagon? Uh, were you aiming specifically to keep the spread of possible values in the same even when you throw everything you've got into the pool? Yeah, um, so backing up a little bit from just the, the roll and keep to, um, one of the things we wanted was an ability to affect your probability but not affect your maximum outcome. So if you added two dice, if you had three or four or five dice, that wouldn't guarantee you anything. We wanted Agon to still be a, uh, a gamble. And uh, John, I'm answering the question about what was the design goal behind roll and keep two dice? Yeah. What, what, and uh, we wanted it to be, even regardless of how many dice you added, we wanted it to be a gamble uh, where the players were sort of looking at the obstacle in advance. That was a key port point is that they knew about the obstacle um, ahead of time and uh, deciding like there's no guarantees I could roll snake eyes on all my dice and, and completely fail but like how much do I want to put into this and there's a little there's a there's a it's a little bit like a little bit like poker playing which is John's a lot more experience than I am but there's this sense of um, how much do you want to commit do you want to go all in on this do you want to hold your resources do you want to support somebody else and get a bond from them rather than trying to get a bunch of glory 
uh, knowing that you can call them out bomb later on in maybe a bigger contest or maybe a contest is more personal to you. Um, so uh, yeah, the poker thing was definitely intentional. Um, and uh, you know, we wanted to, the first game, the first edition was very gamey. Um, it, it was, you know, it was a game that you could like play to win and, and beat the other players at. Um, and that, that aspect changed during the development of, of this version. And it's not something we really wanted to emphasize anymore, but we did still want there to be um, an in, something interesting to, to do as a player, as opposed to just like with, with, with the mechanics, um, as opposed to just supporting the fiction. We wanted to have some game there and this kind of resource uh, management um, was the thing that survived where you, everyone starts with the same amount of chips at the table and you get to decide like, this is the one that's really worth it to me. And in this version of the game, that might be because the contest is worth a lot of glory. Um, so I'm gonna burn real hard and push and, and put, push, put more chips in, put more pressure on the other players. Um, or it could just be because you care more about the fate of this person on the island or whatever. Um, it and, might and not. If you win, you get to stay. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. 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 So, um, have, having having a slightly less swingy um, die mechanic for the players, at adding two dice together, kind of you know gives you a, a prettier bell, <laughs> uh, belt, nice bell curve kind of thing. Um, it means that those pushes that sort of just add on top like divine favor or burning bonds uh, or pathos or whatever, like cha they change it up. But if you're not spinning those things, you kind of have most of your results fall under that in this in this nice range. So um, we, we, we definitely wanted that feeling when you when you decide to burn stuff and push stuff in, it like throws things off and you can tell like, oh, that's that's going to make a difference in the in the role. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, will this be recorded? Yeah, uh, it's being vo vodified on Twitch. Yeah, um, vodified on Twitch. I'll drop it on to the actual play YouTube channel. Oh, it'll be on YouTube too. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Great. So we'll have it. Um, so I apologize. I'm slightly distracted because I just got this notification from Reddit saying that um, my post has been removed because there's no proof included in the post that connects your identity to the IAMA. <laughs> what? Um, oh my God. I, I, I created the IAMA. I am really at a loss when it comes to like Reddit navigation. So anyone who is sitting in Reddit right now, thank you for your patience. I'm pretty far behind on answering these questions because obviously we're doing two things at once. And also I don't know what just got lost. I think I responded to a question and it just like, you know, blipped it out. Uh, I don't know if the entire AMA is down. If anyone's over there and can see, uh, that'd be cool. Just have it up. I won't refresh my page. I can still see some of the questions that were there before. So uh, we can maybe answer those, but yeah, I, yeah. We, this whole AMA thing has been such a pain and Sean did the thing with the proof in the card and stuff and posted it on Twitter. And like, I, I, I don't know what their deal is. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Graham sorry about that. Just said that. Yeah. Very sorry for, 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 for the AMA being, uh, do, for, for, for that working, but you know, please keep answering, asking us questions here. Uh, honestly, it will be less stressful for me to try to, just one thing rather than, rather than two. Uh, and we still have some questions here. So um, um, let's see, are we missing anything in chat? Um, did Twitch streaming podcast actual plays factor in the development or marketing of the game? Or was that the sort of thing is more of a bonus? Uh, that's a good question, Batopian. Um, I think these days it's really, um, I don't really plan on making a game at this point that we don't have a, a provision for playing online with. Um, I think the pandemic is a huge factor, but even uh, COVID aside, people are going to be playing games online in the, you know, from here on out. And so for us, it was very critical that Agon have a character sheet people could play with um, in Roll20. Um, 
and we did most of our playtesting. You know, we did a lot of playtesting in person, but the playtesting we did online, we streamed most of it so that we could, uh, you know, go back and rewatch it and see how it went and see what people thought. Um, I think it's now just part of your arsenal of development tools is having, you know, feedback from people. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it, and it is, it is good for marketing too. Um, um, the online tools, um, you know, at, at this point, Roll20 is like kind of the, the, the hub for that stuff. Um, and Evil Hat's been developing is really great, like packages for their games for Roll Twenty that gives you just tons of cool stuff to to play with. Yeah. Um, and I was like, eh, you know, Agon, like we'll, we'll we'll need a great character sheet. So fortunately, uh, the awesome character sheet designers who made the Blade Sheet for Roll Twenty stepped in and made a great character sheet for yeah. Roll Twenty for Agon because it really needs if without physical dice, like um, it's tricky. And so um, that that I was like that, that that that's great that's all we need and we're good and and Sean was like mm, <laughs> there could be a better package for this and so yeah. made the the Agon Rule Twenty package which is really cool and I I was like eh you know this is it's it looks cool but like I don't know do, do people really need this and everyone was like this is great thank you so much <laughs> so yeah. uh, usually I'm the one being like. I think we should make more stuff. We should have more, you know, more graphics and more of this and more of that. And in this case, I was like, I don't need that. And Sean was totally right. And um, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with some of these new platforms. Um, I haven't started tinkering with them yet. I, I've backed back to their Kickstarter and uh, what's it called? Roll, I think oh, is what it's. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll be making stuff for that too. I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. But um, there's also a really nice tool called Roll Dice with Friends. If you haven't mm -hmm. seen this, um, I used to use an older uh, version of this. Um, I think it was Graham Walmsley's dice roller that used to be around. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's gone now, but rolldicewithfriends.com is very good for Agon play too. Cause it lets you like physically like have dice out on the screen and you can like group them and move them around and like have like kind of a physicality to it. Like sliding a die over to someone else's pile and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, even if you're playing on roll 20 and you're using the character sheets and stuff to do all the automated, automated rolling for you, um, there may be a time where you kind of want to like visualize a pool of dice. So I would recommend that tool too. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah, we, um, and I'm not entirely done, honestly, with the Agon development. Um, the, uh, the islands of Agon were, you know, meant as such, we had the character sheet, we had the islands, but, um, one of the uh, deep, dark, uh, cryptic uh, dungeons of Roll20 is the compendiums. They, they, they are written in structured data format and they, um, and they uh, uh, require a lot, of, uh, a lot of lifting on both the, um, on both the person creating them and on Roll20's part. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've yet to make the Agon compendium. Um, I, I'm still in the process of getting it it set up, but once I have it set up, I'll have this sort of blank canvas to work with, and I'm going to try and make an Agon compendium of that. We'll hold the islands in a way where you could click on it and say like, roll that obstacle, and it would just auto roll it. And if not, it would still be a compendium that would like have the the, the, the contents of the book in it, which is right now it's sort of Agon. Um, you know, you, the intent is that you're still using PDF or the physical book along with it. We're going to see if we can do even more in that space because, yeah, people. I mean. The more you tools, I think that we can put in people's hands. Honestly, I think the easy, the better play experience you get. And that's what we're looking for. Yeah, um, we list. We missed a question from way back. Uh, that, okay. Uh, what do you think of roguelike Hades? I love the. Oh yeah. The gods. I love Hades. Um, I think it's a brilliant. I mean, masterpiece game. I, obviously, I think it won a bunch of awards. Um, but uh, yeah, it it was. It was nice uh, to see that coming around as we were finishing up Agon. Um, like, okay, cool. This is <laughs> it's in the zeitgeist, and AC Odyssey, had, you know, was receding in people's memories, and um, 
I was like, it'd be, oh, it'd be so nice to have a really good touchstone um, to point to that isn't like really much older, like Xena or something. Um, yeah. And there was Hades and I was like, yeah, cool. Like, we'll definitely put this in the book. And um, that was during its early access period. And uh, the final game has turned out to be like, even like way cooler. Um, so yeah, I, I love Hades. It's, it's awesome. I just started playing it. I, I started playing, you know, well after Igon came out and people have been saying, you know, oh, this, this game is fantastic. And I was like, well, I probably should, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I probably should check it out. And um, yeah, I think if I had played it before, there probably, I, you know, there probably would have been more things that, you know, little, little snippets that I would have <laughs> pulled from it. Cause it, it's really great. It's a, it also has a great sensibility that suits Agon really well. Like if, if you play Hades, um, you can carry that into Agon. That it's the, the way it treats the material um, and the characters, the, it, it's not like very precise to the, the myths and, and the original um, yeah. tales and things. <clears throat> it has this kind of modern tone and um the presentation of it, the look of it, and and just the the whole vibe of the thing is like very much what we we're aiming for. I think probably Agon is even even further away in our in our minds a little bit. Uh, yeah, Agon is Greek mythology brought to you by the Fast and the Furious. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's definitely uh, yeah. We 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 we're not trying to emulate um, the the myths as such. We wanted to be inspired by them and have people who had were familiar with with greek mythology feel like oh yeah but not but the, we're still telling new stories none of our islands are based off of um i mean they're all sort of based off of greek mythology because we borrow we dab here and there but none of them are strict recreations of anything um uh, yeah and i think um judd carlman had some really really good uh uh, gaming advice, which was to make failure uh, normal and to uh, foster a world where people, uh, when people fail, when people uh, fall, that others like lend them a hand to get up. And I feel like both Agon and um, Hades have that sense that like, oh yeah, you know, Hades, like you die and it's like, all right, back again, son, let's go to it, right? There's um, there's very, very little sense. And especially with God mode, um, there's, there's very, very little sense of like, you messed up, like you're bad, you're a bad, you're a bad player. And we really didn't want Agon to be a punishing game where if you, you know, it's part of why you get glory, even if just for competing in a contest, you get glory just because you faced that, that terrible monster, even if you, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't succeed. Um, you have glory just for supporting your companions and doing things. Um, you know, we really want that sense of like, yeah, you can suffer horribly, but we are not as game designers going to say you're a bad player or try to punish you because you tried something. Um, you know, your character may now be in agony. Uh, that doesn't make, make you less cool. It doesn't make you less of an awesome character. In fact, going to agony is one of the ways you'll advance because your fate progresses. I mean, your fate progresses, you get, you know, your, your character advances. So um, I like that about it a lot as well. Yeah, yeah, Hades definitely has that feel of fail, failing or, or suffering to succeed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff said, Agon must work really, uh, must work really way better with physical dice. Uh, did you play test virtually or in person? Did COVID affect play testing significantly? Uh, COVID didn't affect play testing because the game was done when, when COVID came around. We were COVID affected print times. <laughs> <laughs> the game was like yeah, four lot. months delayed because of COVID. Yeah, I mean it could have been worse actually. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it was the 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 game was done la last year, uh, so yeah. it was before. But uh, we yeah we play tested both. I ran uh, we ran games in person. We ran games online. Um, you know, games online definitely yeah had especially before the roll 20 character sheet was made before that sheet was made there was definitely a lot of like fiddliness of you know okay everybody this is the format you know curly bracket 
1d6 plus 2d8 plus 1d10 and curly bracket k1 you know uh roll 20 formatting that we would try to uh teach people but um uh but yeah i don't i don't i don't think it was i mean it was never felt like oh we can't play this game online um i never felt no, no, we knew we knew it was going to require some tools to make it more appealing to play online, but it was always intended to work that way. Um, I, I, I'm sure there were conversations during the development when we were like, "We can't do that. That's not that's not going to work online." <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure something came up like that. Well, um, the part of divine favor was like that. We really wanted, you know, roll twenty or any kind of die roller doesn't support rolling after the fact exploding dice after the fact in an elegant way it works but it's a second roll and we knew we were going this way anyway and it was sort of just a fortuitous it was just sort of a fortuitous outcome that we're like yeah we're just gonna have one roll there's not gonna be any re-rolls or yeah that um and that that happens to work out a lot better both in person and in roll 20 you know in person yeah. like that's your role and, and same thing <clears throat> Yeah, that's true. That we, we definitely talked about it when there there used to be rerolls and that was very annoying to do online in particular. So um, um, there's a question of uh, which parts of Agon are easiest and cleanest to hack and which are most interconnected and messy to hack. Um, I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think it's like Forge in the Dark in the sense that changing something like everything is like very fit together, and if you change something, you have to you you've, you're like oh wait now I have to change these other things. Um, yeah, things do fit together in Agon. Obviously, like the systems feed into each other, but I think there's so much simpler and easier to see that you can just be like meh. <laughs> like if I don't have divine favor, I don't have divine favor. Like it's obvious how how that affects the game, um, I think. Uh, but maybe I'm too close to it. Um, I don't. I don't know if there's anything that's like easier or harder to hack in the in the system. I don't think. Um, yeah, like uh, for a long time, one of the things that Pathos did was we had like Pathos die sizes. So your Pathos like started at like D6 and went up to D8, D10, D12. And so like the more you suffered, um, if you wanted to spend Pathos instead of the, 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 the final version is if you spend Pathos, you could bring in another domain. And, um, but an earlier version would be included all sorts of iterations of like, you know, you could spend pathos in advance and you can roll your pathos die and it would go up. And so like the more you were suffering, the more your extra effort meant. Um, and mechanically that didn't really make a big difference. You know, in the beginning you'd be rolling a D6, which isn't quite as good as bringing in an extra domain because usually you bring in your preferred domain as D8, but by the end you could be rolling D10, D12. If you're rolling a D12, you were guaranteeing yourself agony. So it was a big risk, but it was also like, but it's a big die. Um, and that we decided, we elected against that because we really wanted to have a way to bring in another domain. We really wanted to say, you know, players are always saying like, oh, this is, this is a challenge of, of blood and valor, but I want to be tricky and use craft reason. And we're like, okay, okay, Odysseus, you go. Um, and so we and we didn't want too many ways to bring in extra dice. We're like, well, if Pathos does that and something else does this, and so we, we elected to kind of uh, use Pathos to sort of say when you call when you pull, when you pull on your humanity, you're going to pull on the, your strengths. You're going to pull on the, the the domain that is strongest to you. Uh, but mechanically, that 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 was a decision about how the actions that the players would take, but it wasn't a mechanical, huge mechanical significance, right? We didn't, it didn't unbalance things one way or the other to do that. Um, and you could, you could certainly do that and not break the game. But, but then someone would say, I want to bring another domain and you'd be going like, mm, how do I do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think the, uh, one of the, one of the end results of of rebuilding the game several times um, during the course of development uh, was trying to end up in a place where all, most of our decisions were driven by 
um, simplicity as our as our goal. So um, I think we ended up in a place where it's the, the game, the game systems are very transparent and they're they're just like on the surface um, mm -hmm. as opposed to like a forge in the dark design which has these like sometimes far reaching things that happen and and consequences that you don't see in a single session of play you know um, so it makes play testing your changes challenging because um, you need to see these like long processes play out and for time and agon is just like uh, it, it, if the, if it works in a contest and whatever your change is like it's gonna just that's how it's gonna be it's gonna be that way yeah, for everything game, else game design cheat codes friends if you make your game so that it plays in a single session it's way <laughs> easier to play test than if you make your game so it takes 10 sessions to uh to, to you know to really have the whole experience you know, yeah. I love Blades, and I've played uh, a very long campaign with John, but I have run an even longer campaign with my home group. Uh, we hit over 100 sessions. It was bananas. Um, and in 100 sessions, you know, we got to see them go up in tier, and we got to see them interact, the, the, the crew interact with all sorts of forces to the point where, um, you know, uh, Dustfall is now called the North Star. At, in, in our world because one of the forgotten gods has been unleashed uh, and now illuminates the city. Um, but just just that one, you know, and, you know, we got to see you know, over the course of downtimes and, and uh, factions ch changing, uh, huge, huge changes. But, um, you know, that stuff's kind of impossible to play test for. It's really hard to play test for like, what does my game look like in 50 sessions? So it's, it's nice. Uh, Agon was great because we had to really say like, what does our game look like in one session? Uh, you know, the, the Vault of Heaven definitely takes a little bit more, but even that's like, well, we know what you're going to get at the end of a session. It's, it's a few of these stars. So we have to pick how many of those stars we want for how long the play should be. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully there are no like hard parts to hack in Agon, but uh, I, I haven't found them yet, I, I, or, or Sean, but, you know, obviously, <laughs> we're, uh, we know the game well, so yep. um, other people are hacking it now, and, and I'm sure they'll, they'll discover, you know, some wisdom over time, like people have with, with hacking other stuff, where like, eh, don't mess around with that, it's going to be a pain, or or I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think you're right, John. I think, I think other people will know that answer to that question better than we will. Um, let's see. I think Max is. Uh... Yeah, uh, I'll I'll look for another question while you're looking at that. Yeah. Um. Uh oh. Um, Commander Pulsar in Twitch chat is asking about opening up the the Roll Twenty Agon stuff to, to so it's easier to tweak for Paragon stuff. That's definitely something to consider um, having a, a like a customizable like Paragon Roll20 sheet or something. So you could change the labels and that kind of thing. I think some parts of the current sheet are editable. I haven't used it in a little while, but I, I think you can change like the names of the gods and stuff at least maybe. Uh, in um, Roll20 or in Roll20? Yeah. In roll oh, yeah, 20. I think in Roll20, uh, we have to go back to the Wayback Machine, but I'm pretty sure we asked Joseph to make every all the text fields um, uh, editable. We had so, talked about that at one point, yeah. So may maybe you can, if for your own Paragon stuff, you know, obviously changing the way dice are calculated and rolled is a much harder thing to do, but you should be able, I think, to at least change the, the like text and stuff. To, to yeah. fit your um, to fit your hack, um, I'm, I think yeah. Be beyond that, you know, we probably have to know what what someone had in mind for opening things up. Um, but I think so. I'm looking right now. You can change epithet. You can change name. You can change lineage. You can change honored gods. You can change the names of the gods. Um, you can't change the domains because that's a clickable button. But 
Mm -hmm. I think you could find a way around that. I bet you could. I bet someone savvier than I am could probably. Um, Those might be in the in the style sheet mm -hmm. um, file, maybe. So you could maybe change the the text there to change the what's on the button. Maybe yeah. I don't know if it's an image or not. Well, if it's an image, you could change up the image too. I guess. Yeah. Uh, but you can change pathos, you can change agony, you can change fate, great deeds and trophies, boons. Yeah, I think it's pretty flexible. Um, it, it, it might be something that, you know, we could talk to those to those sheet makers and see if they would be willing to do a, yeah. like, kind of generic, like, Paragon sheet. Um, that might be a thing to in the future. Uh, yeah. So I think, I I'm not ruling that out. Yeah, I think I'd say if you're looking for some kind of, uh, if you're looking for uh, uh, some kind of um, change that you can't make right now, just reach out to us. And we'll see if we can, you know, uh, we'll see whether it's it's viable or not. Yeah, because it's certainly certainly something we want to have um, make the barrier to entry into making uh, play sets and whatnot as easy as possible. Yeah. Um, let me look at, I still have the Reddit, <laughs> what was there before it disappeared. Yeah. Uh, um, can it, yeah, th this was the last, uh, oh yeah, from, uh, J.R. Mariano, um, can a hero suffer? from harm if established in the fiction, but not as a consequence from a contest. Um, System-wise, no. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing in, the, in the mechanics of the game that uh, let the Strife player inflict harm um, in that way. Uh, there, I mean, they're, they're yeah. Hmm. The it, it's possible to suffer harm bef by going into a contest. Um, you have to like pay to play uh, with either pathos or divine favor. <laughs> um, so in that sense, it's not the consequence of the contest after the fact. It's like an upfront cost. Uh, but yeah, yes. there's no there's no fictional there's there's. <laughs> it's weird like harm harm in in mechanically in agon is is pathos or divine favor uh being used um what you can do is say like um if you're going if you're at uh um spira let's say and like the the machine is grabbing your ship and dragging it into its metal jaws to rend it into splinters um, like you could say like that, that, that happens and all the heroes are scattered into the waves and they're, they're drowning. And, you know, you can say all this fictional stuff is happening. You know, you're, you're getting slammed against the rocks and you're bl bl bloodied and, and dazed and all that stuff can happen in the fiction. Um, and the heroes can respond by jumping into a contest to be like, whoa, 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 no, we're gonna like, we're gonna swim for it or we're gonna save people or we're gonna do whatever. And they're gonna push into that contest and harm and stuff can happen mechanically there. But fictional harm in the sense of like being beaten up and bruised and bloodied and stuff can, ha can, can be part of the narrative of play yeah. um, where there's no like um, damage trackers and stuff, the, the, the harm the physical harm uh, happening to fictional characters is kind of held in the fictional space. And then mechanical harm may or may not be damage. Uh, it's it's burning pathos or losing divine favor. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at like um, the beginning of uh, Thor Ragnarok where we find Thor and he's like trapped in a in a in a yeah. in a net and he's and he's like hey skeleton you want to know the story of how I got to be here and Thor looks beat up but when the net drops and he falls to the ground he's like and he's like at the mercy uh, of, of his of his foe 
he's like, cool, I, I'm right where I wanted to be, right? And I think that that's the nature of these characters. Like you can, you can crash the boat against the rocks and you can leave them battered and bloody. Um, that may be exactly when they're at their, their best, right? You know, and that, that may not reflect uh, their divine favor or their pathos in any way. Um, that you know that may be the sort of style of, of hero that they are, um, or style of, of of conflict that you want to frame. Um, but uh, so yeah, so yeah, feel feel free to 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 do things. And if you're going to make a narrative uh, assert, assertion that the players are going to argue with, or the players are going to take take umbrage with, then that's a great place for a contest right there. You're like, oh yeah, that your ship has crashed into the rocks and is splintered, and they're like, nin. I am the best sailor since in the, you know in the western winds. I am going to sail us out of here, right? And uh, and that's a great craft and reason contest that you may not have expected before, but you realize that that's that's what's applicable there. Um, so, yeah, yeah, L lots and lots of ways to beat people up and make it look cool if you would like. <laughs> yeah, and and the players will do that too, like be, be, because you you narrate um, when you suffer. Uh, in a contest, you know, the, that's, that's very, most often where, um, like, fictional damage and stuff will come from. The players will be describing yeah. what's happening to their own character. Um, the strike player doesn't have to necessarily inflict those things. Um, Uh, Jeff says, um, question, we found that failure and suffering happens a lot in our game, but more often than not, someone prevails and the story moves forward. Do you generally see the prevailing characters bringing their fellows along or does failing and suffering often leave someone behind? Examples, climbing a mountain, uh, sneaking into a palace. So the rules, the, the rules we wrote them is that if the heroes prevail, then the heroes prevail. If one, if one of the heroes prevails, then the heroes prevail, right? So um, the others might, if there was harm on the table for the contest, the others who suffered might uh, might endure some harm because of that. Um, and the ones who suffered are going to describe how they uh, were thwarted. But the the core conceit is that as long as at least one of the heroes prevail, they've overcome that contest. Um, so if you were going to say we're sneaking into the palace, and one person prevails and one person suffers then the person who's suffering, the player could certainly elect to say like, oh no, I, I'm gonna get caught. And so I flee out the back and I'm ashamed now and I'm trapped outside. And that's really sort of a narrative choice of that, that player. They could just as easily say like, uh, I, get, I get frozen um, and I'm afraid that the guards are gonna catch me and I like hide in a shadow and I wait for my friend to like lead me, you know, find the path. That leads into the palace and then the one the person who because you always narrate from lowest to highest role the person who narrated at the highest can say yes you know i lead all my friends who were you know i i, I teach them the ways the stones to step on that won't creak the floors i i distract the guards so they can get by they can be super cool and describe how even though you suffered they still get you through um so yeah our general intent is to say like if the heroes prevail then then the threat is overcome um, yeah yeah that's that's generally how it goes um but you know it like sean said there's it's mostly up to the to the players uh since they're going to be narrating their their suffering so um we, we we've had cases um where the the group like you know someone gets gets uh dragged off by the serpent cult and um is is alone or whatever cut off from the other heroes or th those kind of things uh can happen but um there it's also the the nature of the way contests work and bonds and things like that um you can either participate when you're not present in some ways like doing you're all involved in a contest even if you're not in the same room or um suddenly arriving uh at, you know we thought you were lost. You're like, ha ha, no, <laughs> you know, I'm back. Uh, that there's a lot of there's a lot of room um, for that kind of elastic uh, fiction in Agon. It doesn't. It's it's not room by room. You know, clearing um, 
uh, uh, Rainbow Six style or, or D and D dungeon crawls or something, where you need to like everything needs to be very regimented on where everybody is and exactly what lines of sight and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, Agon is not like that, so it gives you a lot of freedom to like have these dramatic uh, ev events that that are spanning over many days or uh, flexible geographically, where we're we're here, we're there, we're montaging and the game the systems of the game uh function the same um yeah. you don't you, you don't need to um keep it kind of controlled in that sense so one of my favorite battles in playtesting uh, uh on soros and ion was when um was when in the in the, in the clash um the uh the engineer made this incredibly uh like got all the villagers from um, Ion to, to help her make this incredible net that, that nothing could break through. And then they dragged Orta into, they, they, they like looped the net around Orta and like wrestled him in under the waterfall. And then the finale was, and then we hold him for a week under the water until he dissolves into the earth that he was made of, right? Like that was the final, that was the finale contest was a week of wrestling the giant into the waterfall to turn back to earth. And, uh, you know, and it's that's that it, that's how long that contest took a week, right? Versus you know, yeah. Week. So I, lo I love the functional flexibility that we get, that we uh, put in there because it, you know, you think of these like epic stories and you're like, can I fast for seven days and seven nights? Yeah, sure. That's totally you know, contest to say if you know find out if you're still awake when the shadow lords come after seven days of fasting. You know. Yeah, one of the islands, uh, which isn't even really an island, uh, Timisos um, has a potential like starvation thing that can happen there. So it's implied that like you're lost in the labyrinth for, for days and days or weeks. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun, fun aspect of the game. A, having the players narrate their own failures, um, which gives them a lot of control over that kind of thing, being separated or whatever. And also the the way that the contests the system doesn't really care about those details, so you're free to be loose with that stuff. Uh, hey, we've got we've got Andrew in there. Uh, Hello. Maybe someone already asked this. Just got here, but when how did the idea of uh, to do your own hacks of Agon come in? I think uh, the second day of Agon development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, pretty, pretty early. Um, yeah, I mean, dur during the development, uh, I, I guess we did touch on this a little bit earlier, but um, run running um, the Fast and the Furious version uh, was pretty early in the in the process, um, and how mainly because. It was always this touchstone that whenever we talked about Agon um, and the tone of it and like, like yeah, it's Xena, it's irreverent, um, but man, it's like the Fast and the Furious. It just feels like the Fast and the Furious. Yeah. Uh, I we we just always, in one yeah. Time, that, he, he was a Greek character, but yes. That, I, I, that was your first Agon 2E character, I think. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that whole, everyone in the group, right? I think because I think Allison had a, her her yeah. character was named Fast and Furious style as well. I think. I think so. Yeah. It was it was a long time ago, but um, it wasn't Zentropa. It was a character before. It was yeah. It was before that, yeah. But yeah, but, we were just playing it very silly. We were definitely Greeks. We were definitely playing mythological characters, and we were definitely also playing. You know, like, okay, you're Dom, I'm Letty, <laughs> you're Brian, right? Yeah. We're also, we're also playing those archetypes. So I was like, well, I'm going to make a character sheet <laughs> that, that has a place to draw your car and, and like, is, is this really a thing? And yeah, and then, and then we like played it like right away, basically during the development. Um, and then uh, did a stream of it and, um, it it just it, it it instantly like fit and and made sense uh 
so the idea of doing more hacks and um, it became an obvious path because the very first attempt like worked great. So yeah. if, if that had not worked, then it would have been, you know, a different, a different path, but um, since it did and, and it was such a touchstone for the, for the ancient myth game, um, it just made sense to keep going. But, uh, you know, some things are not going to be a, as good a fit and, um, We'll see. Like I, I, I'm curious about Chamber, honestly, because um, it tonally, it's a, it's strange, um, or not strange. It's just different. It's very different. Um, and I think like pursuing insight as a thing instead of glory is an interesting idea, and I think that mechanic will support that. But um, all the other types of hacks are like, woo, ha ha, yeah, fun, jump off a building. Um, and chamber definitely yeah, isn't that so. Uh, I yeah, I'm I'm curious how that. So I know Strash has been running it, so we'll debrief with him at some point. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's been uh, so far. It's been like, oh, what what about what if this was a hack? Like, oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so well, and that's the nice thing about playing in this space is like with Icon we felt, I think, reasonably that we had to get it right. We had to make a game that was a really solid experience through and through that people could play multiple sessions of and really have a good time with and the game would support them. And because we were printing a book and there's some finality to a book, you know, nothing is ever done, 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 but it's, it's as done as we're going to make it. And um, short of maybe somebody finding a typo somewhere that we put in errata that, you know, the, the, game's, the game's complete. Um, but that's not the case with chamber and storm breweries and surge projectors and whatever else we make. Like we have the freedom to like put these games out, let people play them, find out there's things we want to change and change them. And, and so the bar, and that's the same yeah. with anybody else making Paragon game, uh, products is that the bar is, uh, of like how finished does it need to be is much lower. You can really get feedback and start kind of playing immediately and revise as you go. Um, I'm about to release Search Treasure 1.2 because I keep finding little, you know, little, little fixes, little tweaks, um, and that's and that's that's fine. And I th I think it's great to just let you like get something out rather than like I have to spend forever to get it just right. So yeah, not sure that that's answering a question, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Came to me. Um. Yeah. If you had to pick an anthem song for Agon, what song would you pick? That's a good question. Uh, I usually have like a theme song in mind for my games, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I ever really had one in my head for this game. Well, well there was, there was one <laughs> um, that I wanted to use in the Kickstarter video. Um, uh, which is a Beat Saber song. Um, and it turned out that it was like just a Beat Saber song and couldn't be licensed or covered or anything. Um, and um, <laughs> Allison says anything with the lyrics taking it to the limit. Uh, yeah. Um, so Allison wrote and recorded a version um that had the feel and energy of that of that song that beat saber song that i wanted to use um so in that sense the game literally has an anthem theme song because yep. it's the one on the kickstarter video that allison wrote which is um, amazing allison That's yeah phenomenal. um but like as in, in terms of like popular pop song pop culture reference um yeah I, it, it never had like like the blades, you know, Nico Case, you know, theme song. Um, I don't know. Did you did you have like a a popular song in mind when I, you? I don't think so. I think I had a lot of '80s ballads going through my head, um, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, and that may be because 
we were also making it in a time where a billion Marvel movies were coming out. So things like Immigrant Song, you know, keeps coming back over and over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also those are just sort of the, uh, you know, the, 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 those, those rock ballads that include like a whole story, you know, like, um, you know, like uh, Bon Jovi, <laughs> you know, Dead or Alive kind of, uh, kind of, um, uh, kind of tunes. Uh, but nothing. But there was not a, a fixed one. Um, a, a, a once, once the Kickstarter video, once the, the audio for the Kickstarter video was done, like that's the thing that I keep coming back to, and I will sometimes play that. And I just I love that. It's such a beautifully composed piece, um, and uh, and um, you know it's it's. I we, we John and I talked a little bit about the choreography if we were gonna. Have, uh, have it a little like a live action video like it, it turned out to just be like such an ordeal to to do it so um but like i also have some like imagery of you know this this epic kind of smash cut flying through the air with the spear action which you which you see in the art of the book you know some of some of the book art is also um actually you see it right here in my <laughs> yeah um uh, um let's see if you had to no, that's not it. Um, uh, any favorite pet mechanics and ideas that didn't make the final cut? Oh yes. Oh yeah, I have I have at least two. What about you, John? Any any favorite mechanics that we favorite mechanics that didn't make the final cut? Yeah. Um, oh, hang on. I'm gonna put this. Uh, I'll put this link in chat to that song I was talking about in case people are curious. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and on my YouTube channel, the Agon Kickstarter video is um, is there, so you can hear Allison's version there. Uh, and I'm I will link. I might as well link that too while we're at it. Yeah. Um, well, while you're linking, I will talk about my 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 favorite pet mechanics that didn't make it. Um, so the number one favorite mechanic that I had that did not make it was achievements, um, and we we snuck it in in a different way, but in 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 for many many versions of Agon, the game would start. You'd make your characters, and like Dogs in the Vineyard, or there's probably some other games that do this as well. One of the things we'd start with was like, tell us about some great deed you had, and the players would each frame a contest, and they could be as specific as we were trying to, um, you know, get the our ship across this roaring sea while the enemy was firing flaming arrows at us, and we had to deliver people to the other side safely. You know, they could they could be very specific, or they could say, I don't know, give me a challenge of resolve and spirit. You know, what do you, what do you think? And uh, but essentially, they would pick the domain. Often, they would pick the domain that was strongest to them. Oh, we lost a John. Um, how do I fix this? There we go. There's not John, but a uh, a John a John stand in. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure John will be back shortly. This was only supposed to go till four, so maybe John's just like hard cut. No, <laughs> I'm out. Uh, but um, achievements were uh, something where the players got to initiate their own contest, and we loved the mechanic. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> places um, and the players got to basically frame other on contest and I just felt like players love love loved that like yeah back in the day when we were trying to climb the walls um, and it was a super super fun mechanic it also felt like by the time we were done we're kind of like we're done with character creation and I kind of felt like we played the game like it took a long time if in a four player game that was four contests an island was often about four contests, you know? So it would feel like, yeah, that was really fun. But also like, if we want to create characters and play an island in a session, it felt really, really long. Um, so we eventually took out the achievements um, and we made leadership at the very beginning, a very small contest, a very, a very small, you know, very minor contest that was kind of before you were on the island. But I snuck it in. Um, if you look at the island of Eno, 
Um, it's basically the island of, I'm so weary from all the nights I've tried to stay asleep. And if I fall asleep tonight, the, serp the, the, the shadows will overtake me. Please, heroes, tell me of your great stories to keep me awake. Um, and the only way to keep her awake is to tell your great stories, which is basically like, remember back in the day, and to frame your own shields. So, um, but now there's, there's, there's a stake, right? There's a cost, which is, you know, if she falls asleep, then, uh, then the, the, the owner I come. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that was probably my biggest pet mechanic that I, we realized. Mm, very the sneaky. Game, the good of the game had to go. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, John? Any uh, any pet mechanics you you uh, you miss that we give up? Um, there are certainly a bunch that I'm glad are gone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think there are any that. Well, I guess. some things from first edition that that are cool uh but just didn't like make sense in this version of the game at all i i'm not really like glad they're gone or sad they're gone um because they wouldn't work in this version um but like having your your handedness you know with your dice like i've got my shield dice in my left hand and my spear dice in my right hand and you're defending and attacking and like that that was always a just a cool little gimmick in in the game and people will often people who've played that version and and encounter second edition well that's usually what they'll say they'll be like oh i wish the i wish the left and right hand dice um it still we're still there uh so I guess I, I, I do kind of miss that, um, but it it's not it's not like oh I, it, it it this this game should have handed this dice like in, in nah it, it it definitely shouldn't but yeah. um, in, in in the in the in the goal to simplify that was one of those things where we're like uh, we're effectively creating two contests per contest when we do that and we want fewer yeah. contests yeah it was. Getting fewer contests was definitely hard because we loved them. We loved our contests. And uh, yeah, it's, um, and, and so yeah. Yeah, I miss that too. I miss the handedness. Um, that pathos mechanic that I talked about a little bit earlier of like the more beat up you are, the bigger your pathos die, um, that was taken right out of um, the exhaustion mechanic from Don't Rest Your Head, which is something I've always loved, where basically you kind of, your death spiral goes up like the, the more beat up you get, the, the tougher you get. Um, and that one was another one where I liked it a lot, but it didn't fill the role that we needed. And we had something else that did full, fill the role that we needed. So, uh, you know, it's still, it's in Don't Rest Your Head. It's in some other games as well. It's not like it's a, a you know, it was lost forever, but uh, that was a that was one that I held on to for a while. Um, and just, just Yeah, I think... I think uh, in in Paragon hacking and stuff, stuff like that could could come back around, and mm -hmm. um, the exact way that that Pathos works and feeds into Fate or Doom or something, and how you what happens when you spend it, and you know those those kind of tweaks could make sense for other hacks. I think maybe, um, yeah, because it, it it did work. Uh, it just it just wasn't what we ultimately wanted for agon um, yeah yeah it, did, it didn't fit the bill right it was just like cool yeah. that's fun but it's not serving the need that we had yeah. yeah um jeff says haven't had a chance to read chamber yet but i understand it's kind of like x files sort of situation how do contests fit into that situation or fit into that fiction sorry um yeah do, do you expect all hacks to be about heroes and contests uh no not not heroes in the add-on sense. Um, that's easy. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, you know, su superhero-ish type stuff, um, which is another reason why I we always are banging on about Fast and Furious because the the especially like after uh, five, four five, five. like five five definitely is getting into superheroics. Yeah. Um, 
gravity is purely optional. Yeah, the, totally the optional. Is totally malleable. <laughs> the the way that contests work uh, mechanically, it it's sort of easier if you have a like we were talking about before. You have like an elastic fiction um, that isn't too concerned with nitpicky reality, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, but Chamber, I, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier too, that it, it, it is doing something different and the characters are much more human um, uh, in terms of what they're able to accomplish and stuff. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that works. Um, and, and, and because you are um, the the track the the insight track as, as opposed to glory or reputation or or honor or um resistance like in uh, in search protectors um kind of this like you're like in all the other agon stuff you're kind of becoming more uh like bigger and and better and and everything and in chamber it's like you it's almost like veterancy sort of you're like developing this experience with this strange thing and that's increasing the die but it's also kind of implies that like you're you're um getting more and more entangled in this strange um strange it's got world some mythos kind of vibes to it a little the bit of a yeah you learn about it the more it affects you you stare yeah at this and you know it stares back yeah and i i i messed around with that as a as an idea um to let to have the um, the ops player, the strife player, uh, like roll your insight die against you, mm. um, and I was like, mm, no, I think it's more interesting if it's focused on the artifacts, and that gives the strife player dice, uh, the wrath dice, essentially to like to to roll, um, because then it's more tied to like the objects and the the signal stuff signal, directly. Yeah. Um, it's a little easier to implement if if you're like, oh, it's the anchor. It's that that boat anchor that like hovers in the air and whips around at the speed of sound. Like, I know how to use that die in a contest <laughs> against you. Right. Um, it's very clear what to do with that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that turned out to be a better fit. But um, again, I be, because of the the player driven um, sort of narration stuff in in the way that agon contests work, I I think. Um, that it will also support more human, more nitty gritty like stuff. If the players understand that that's the thing we're trying to do, um, then their narrations will be in that vein instead of I kick down a mountain. Um, so, and, and I think a lot of Agon, a lot of getting the right fit for Agon is um, getting that that. Uh, a shared understanding of the of the genre and what's going on when you say we're playing these big greek heroes that are larger than life um then you know people narrations stretch into those spaces and when you say we're playing these normal these normal people trying to figure out this you know unknown alien technology um it the, the game i think does a good job of of not uh never never uh, associating too strongly the mechanical die rolls with the where the fictional positioning is so that you have the ability to kind of frame it as you need for the game because even in agon you can certainly have you know one of the things you probably don't see as much of an agon but i have seen and i love is like the king is weeping because he has lost his you know son and he is crying over his son's tomb um can you can you help him uh you know uh, can you support him in in his uh in his sorrow right like can you help someone who, who is weeping like that is not that is not asking for a character to kick down a mountain right that's asking for a character to be human and supportive and caring and uh empathetic uh and those are great parts of greek is you know greek mythology as well we don't focus on them too much in the game but they're there you know if you look at nemos the the the, the king is is quite sad if the prince is gone and um uh, and when people do engage in it, you can just you can immediately feel like the tonal shift, the 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 the, the, the action that's going to wrap around it is going to be appropriate. And uh, so I think we got we're very fortunate with that that like we don't have too many disconnects between um, 
you know, the, the, the mechanical outcomes and the narrative ones. Um, yeah, in that sense, it's a little like in the uh, Blades in the Dark style, kind of, where it's saying everyone together is responsible for the fictional material. It's not the Game Master's job to kind of corral everything. Um, so the, the borders of that... Um, the character's capabilities or their presentation on screen and our in our imagination and stuff is kind of like our shared um, responsibility as as the group. Um, and I, I that that that's just a, a, a way that I think we just like to play. Yeah, most yeah, games in that in game that mode. Style, yeah. yeah. So it naturally comes out in the design. Um, there's um, a really good question in here from Sentinel Greg. Um, did any specific instance lead to the cultural primer at the back of the book? Lots of ancient Greek historians being pedantic in your playtests. Um, yeah, something very specific led to it. No, it was not pedantic playtesters. Our playtesters were uh, were great and and very supportive. In fact, I I almost I don't think I ever ran into really pedantry when it came to Agon. Even people who were like, I love Greek history were never like, you got it wrong. Or I love Greek. Like no one ever thought we were trying to get it. <laughs> like exactly right. Um, but uh, John Staropoulos, uh, who was a, a good friend of ours and um, who was a, you know, was a Greek uh, man. Uh, and he, he, he looked at the book and he said, um, at the time when John looked at it, it was almost, it was, it was, almost divorced from being Greek heroes. Like we didn't call them, we didn't say you're from Greek. We just said you're heroes of myth and legend. And, and yet we still had the Greek gods. We had a lot of the artifacts of Greek mythology. And uh, John made a really, really good point, which is that, you know, uh, Greek mythology is just considered fair game for most people to, to, to draw from. It's, uh, I think someone even mentioned it earlier, like it's in the zeitgeist of Western culture. People grab from it all the time. But in doing that, they often, either forget or just don't really uh, consider the fact that Greeks are real live living people today. And Greece in particular is suffering tons of financial and, 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 uh, and, and political uh, strife and, and, and challenges right now. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, it would have been really uh, unfair of us, I think, to sort of cherry pick those fun, yay, heroic Greek stories without also acknowledging like the culture the real living and current culture that they come from um and that we're that we're borrowing from um and so uh you know we we, we kind of turned around on that we, we we were more emphatic about saying that these are greek characters uh, although it's still not hugely permeating the game you can we we we, we you could ob obviously change it as the paragon system says to like other uh, the pantheons, other places, but um, we 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 kind of redoubled that effort to be cognizant of where we were setting it because it is a real place. Uh, you know, Greece is a real place, and 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 Greek people um, have a have a culture that is current. Um, so yeah, I think that that primer was a really important piece of the game, and it's something I'm really glad we we got in there. And it, it really came from a place of love. John uh, uh, Stravopoulos loved the game. Just wanted to see, you know, the culture we were borrowing from really be represented. Uh, and so he worked with James Mendes Hodes, who was a cultural consultant, and they they wrote it up for us. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a, an important component, um, a, almost a balance between our kind of it's the Fast and the Furious, woo, do anything, yeah, uh, which is a kind of heart of of our the design that we were making. Um, it needed to have that balance of, of recognizing like, yeah, th these are fun things to play with, uh, but they come from somewhere and they have meaning and they're, um, there's, there's a, a current living culture that, that this is a part of. And um, it, it, it felt irresponsible to not, um, address that in any way um, and and also James uh, did did some more work there to like 
talk about other uh, mythic bases, a basis for, you know, and give, giving a good example for like drawing from a different uh, uh, mythological basis. Um, if you want to try that when you play and um, that was something that first edition sort of casually mentioned at the end as like, oh, you could do this other thing, um, have changed the gods up or whatever. And I think James provided a nice example of, of doing that while also like keeping it inside that primer of like thinking about these things um, as, as real, you know, coming from real people in the real world. Um, they're not just um, uh, these ancient forgotten things. So yeah. it's good to, it's good to always keep that in mind. Um, I and, think. And Mendez did a lot of uh, reviewing um, uh, of the, he, he reviewed the whole text as well to see like, you know, he helped us, um, which I think just made the text stronger. You know, we had a lot of spellings that were anglicized or romanized, right? That are just our kind of, our, our understandings of the spellings. Uh, and even though John is like, John is far better than I, than I am at, at, at knowing the actual Greek spellings of things. Even there, there's a few things that weren't really Greek per se. And Mendez helped us either just a small thing is changing the spelling or, um, you know, even, uh, there weren't huge changes, but there were, there were a few, few terms and whatnot that we really kind of um, tailored and, 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 and changed. So it was just a, it was a great, you know, he was, you know, the best experiences I feel like you ever have with somebody working on your text is when they're really excited about it too. And, and they were all like, we love this game. We want it to be better, right? We want it to be, you know, more accessible, more approachable. Um, to do better service. So yeah, it was great. Yeah, we've we've had great experiences with um, sensitivity readers and, and consultants in that in that regard uh, on, on various projects um, that I you know, I, there's no going back like that's Yeah, all, it's always going to happen on all projects for me and, and, and probably evil hat in general um because it's just it's always been such a positive thing um in, including when the, the feedback is like you have to take this out this is awful um <laughs> you never should have you never should have written this uh like that's just great uh it's so great to get that um that kind of feedback uh, I, I i will never i, I don't ever want to go without it <laughs> again um, and to have to have the the kind of sensitivity consultancy read is one thing, but then also to get this whole extra component of the primer being written to include in the book was like the cherry on top. Yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. It was one of those things where the more the more John Severopoulos and and Mendez were talking to us, the more we're like, yeah, yeah we want to capture that. Like they'd say something in an email or a G chat or something like that, and we're like, oh yeah but also those are your words and like i could rewrite them but what do you think about also being a contributing writer <laughs> you know and, and adding those mm -hmm. and and that flowed it was really a nat it wasn't intended initially and it sort of flowed naturally as we kept working together um jeff uh, i think it's another question chamber related but you know i i could see this in other uh paradigm games as well what uh, scene do you see in your head when one of the investigators is the best at investigating something, I'm picturing Castle more than more than Mulder. <laughs> um, it's yeah. It, being best is is interesting in in Chamber um, because you have to in Agon. Um, typically, I mean, you can do investigations in Agon too. I think Nemos probably involves a little bit of that sometimes um but in chamber there there are going to be a lot more cases where you're like i want to figure out what's going on here and then you everybody rolls and like everyone then has to like say what their character is doing but also like the outcome of that uh and obviously the ops player is like doing the agon thing where you're like narr narrating in between the players as they as they step through their results um and so it's it it is that you're best but not really in agon terms like 
in agon terms, you you like did it the best. And we put it that way because you're it's glory that you're achieving. Um, and in Storm Fury is it's glory you're achieving. You want your call sign engraved in the bronze wall of the of the pilot's ready room. And so it's still it's still glory <laughs> in Storm Furies. And in Search Protectors, it's resistance to the evil uh robot bad guys and the wire empire you are the best uh cool transformer robot in that contest um but yeah in chamber it's it, you're not like i'm the best investigator it's because it's insight that you're gaining not renown or glory or or acclaim um so your your character achieved the most insight in that contest but you aren't showing off how 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 you're the best investigator because the because of just changing the word glory to insight changes the nature of um what we're competing against so to speak because it, it's it's not even really a competition anymore if it's not glorious or whatever um so that's not uh, overtly stated in the chamber text um, and in the next revision, maybe I'll add a paragraph about that. Um, I feel like if I was playing it, I would um, ascribe some additional understanding if I, if I was the player who was best. And so it, let's say one person succeeds, they, they don't suffer, they, they prevail, but they're not best. And they say, aha, we can tell, you know, um, the, the signal was here uh two hours ago and then and then the and then the the residue has is fading and uh you know and they, they can find out all of these in, this information and i feel like for me as as the best players you know i would look at another like well can we know what and i'm going to add another like why like ah they must have been running in a in a in a in a, in a and they must have been chased out of here uh they were afraid of something you know and and, and like it, you know this other threat is upon them right and, and i feel like you know we have all of these possible uh, conclusions we can come to and you know you can sort of add on that like well if we, if we know how then do we know what or why or when or yeah you know, so, and especially specifically like the why of like knowing the mind of you know whoever is involved whoever you're investigating is always one of those like pseudoscience -y, ridiculous sort of investigatory things but it's super cool in fiction to be like ah you know you can see that they were they were angry when they did this they were they were scared when they did this uh mm -hmm. i feel like you mm -hmm. can add those that would be my inclination at least as a perspective chamber player right? <laughs> yeah yeah i i think that's that's a, a good way to look at it um but again it'll be it, it'll th there will be a group dynamic um that will emerge just like it does with regular Agon um, in exactly how we, like our style of narration, because it is, it is the, there's that structural component of um, it's ordered. Uh, um, every, every group is gonna like develop a house style a little bit uh, in when they play, cause it's gonna, it, 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 it continuously comes up every contest is yeah. the, the first part, which is like announcing yourself part. And then the narration part is very structured in this game. And um, every group's gonna, since you just do it over and over and over again, you're, you're gonna develop a style over time. That, I'm, that, I'm kind of amazed nobody's asked us the question of, uh, why do you roll dice before narrating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean hopefully it's like obvious so no one's yeah. asked um yeah. but yeah no but it was it's just one of those things that we that was not you know that was not day one right that was a part of iteration as well but, um sentinel greg has another question which i think I, it's a really good one i thought about this myself <laughs> thanks <Sentinel Greg. laughs> um the uh, the agon islands provide a ton of material and suggesting for each episode so far the other play sets have been a bit lighter in that regard is that intentional or islands just a lot of work <laughs> um, islands are a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> at this point i think we've gotten pretty good at making islands um but they are still a decent chunk of work. I, I would say 
making making the playset was about as much work as making a, an island mm -hmm. in just in terms of like mental effort and stuff maybe not time but like um so yeah for bo both of my both of my current hacks don't use really an island type structure i mean they kind of do but um mostly intentionally like i want a to see like what it's like if you don't have that um and it is is that feasible or or what um well, and and, and really, b because it is it's work to make an island and you're really good at creating like mission generators that are really exciting and, and evocative like agon first edition was like that you know there was a tables in the back of like what is the group what do the gods want and what what is the threat and you had all these d12 tables of really cool and fun things and you know someone could throw a bunch of dice down and figure out what was going on on the island and we intentionally wanted with agon to make the on-ramp to being a strife player easier so we're like no we're just we're just going to give it to you. you can of course make your own island but like we yeah. can give you 12 islands to go with 12 gods to go with our d12 to go with all our, our <laughs> everything else um yeah. And uh, but but you know in both chamber and much more so in storm furies you've got these great generators that that you know give just enough I think to like create some cool situations out of them. Yeah, it and, and it, it's true. Like the the Agon Islands are they really are like not the only reason they exist in in that written format, but the main reason they're done that way is is to make playing the strife player less intimidating um and not because you have to have them to run agon i i can we can play agon right now i i can just make up an island out of my head right in this moment yeah um and what what would, what would the arrival challenge be okay let's do that and then we could just we could play right now um after you i think after you've run and played agon a bit that type of play comes pretty naturally um so it's I, I don't think that like having pre-written location-based adventures is a necessary component of a paragon game um it's just it makes it makes being the gm obviously much simpler uh and if you have something else like incursions which are very tiny islands um or mission generator or whatever that also makes running the game slightly easier but you don't need them they're they're just like it, they're nice they're they're a, they're a thing that makes makes playing uh us uh, less less troubling troublesome and and there was uh for me at least i won't i won't speak for you john but there was at least also a little bit of a little bit of ego that went into those islands which is like i want to hear people's stories about going to my islands right when someone's like oh yeah we went to soros and ion i'm like "Ooh, what did you do what did yeah. you do with the king what did you do with the giant how did you face did you what did, did what happened to me i'm i'm curious you know i like i like hearing I mean, I like hearing about when people go to, to, to any, like to John's Islands or to any of the Stretchical Islands too, like, because I've, I have, uh, you know, um, uh, I've adopted all of those, that those into like my own pantheon of the world. Like Agon doesn't have a fixed setting, but in my mind, there's this nebulous uh, uh, sense of the, of the, of the islands. And I, and I just love hearing the stories about when people went to them. So um, there's that too. I, yeah, I like, that's I like that. <laughs> that is a component. Uh, we we I, they they were probably like the most the most labor component. Uh, I was gonna say laborious. They weren't laborious. They were they were like in terms of effort, probably the thing we worked on the most. Yeah. In, in for that book, um, we had three islands for the longest time. Mm -hmm. and, and like and like three islands and like a handful of unfinished ones and um and then the uh and then and then we started doing a few more and it was yeah it they were yeah there were there was a, there, there were a lot went into them and the stretch goal authors um i it was funny i got to sort of revisit that experience with the stretch goal authors because the stretch goal authors created islands and I and I, I think I re realized how challenging they are to think of all of those all of the the threats. I I worked both of us worked with all of them. There was not a single 
such goal that kind of came to us like here you go because and that wasn't because the writers weren't fantastic writers they were amazing writers but they 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 really uh, they weren't steeped in the game like we've been for two years and um so we spent a lot of time um helping them make the trial make the the, the trials be you know reflect what they want to see uh, so many times someone would come to me and be like i really don't want an outcome where like they side with the evil king and they like fight off the people and i'm like well then don't make that a battle option They're like but what if the players decide i'm like don't ask them the question of like will you dethrone the king by defeating his army or will you dethrone him by proving that he does not have the right to rule you know <laughs> like which way will you dethrone the evil king that is that is the those are the two battles you could have, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, you just don't need the, like, what if my players are fascists battle? Like, no, <laughs> none of that. Don't, don't um, include that. <laughs> but it wasn't, it, it's not intuitive. It's not at all intuitive to think, like, that you can use the islands to kind of constrain, even though the islands are not fixed, right? Like, players can do things that you don't include in the contests, but you can choose which contests you present, and you can yep. choose to have contests that are designed around your own ethos and what you want to see. Yeah, yeah. This you're you're actually answering. We started to answer one of the questions from Reddit. Uh, oh yeah. Which, which the last one that I can see. Um, that uh, it, 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 they're asking um, Master RPG seventy nine. Is there a little chance that some Agon sessions are railroaded? Some islands in the books have event scenes proposed from the strike player to the heroes. Uh, is that the expected effect or game style you want to achieve? And you're touching on that. Um, that they're like rail railroading is you know one of those loaded rpg terms that means 11 different things to thousand different people and um we don't need to get into like defining what that is but um yeah the they they are they're they're we specifically wrote the islands in a format to so the strike player could almost just read it out and it and it and actually like walk through it and, then, and for the heroes to just be like yes we, we do no we do that no yes we'll do that we're going over here here's a new contest how are we going to address it and it is like extremely um rote if you if no i don't think anyone runs them that way um but we intentionally did that just again for a first timer who's never run a game before we do give you those three spreads in the book of like, here's like general GMing tools and, and guidance and methods, but that takes time to develop those skills and um, highly structured. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Uh, they're highly structured um, j just to take the pressure off the, the person, the strife player. If, if, if they're just like, Ugh, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do this. They could just be like, okay, you arrive. Here's what happens. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and the even... players have their freedom to do whatever. Uh, they're, they're not, they're, they're constrained in the sense that they're stuck on this island right now. Um, I mean, they can just turn around and leave, <laughs> but usually. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is, it was very intentional that, that they be presented in that format um, because we're not gonna kick down your door and say, why aren't you railroading your heroes? Like we wrote, like if, if we give you that highly structured format, then you can riff on it however you want. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of hard to do it the other way around. It, even to the point of uh, the arrival contest was also not something originally in there. You know, we had lots of different trials and it was like, okay, you arrive and you know uh here's the sad king and here's the mysterious serpent cult and here's the tower where they're concocting something what do you want to do and players would often be like well you know they'd have that kind of like internal discussion of this guy seems shady and they'd ask questions and all those things are great but the 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 feeling that we wanted for the game was like this you know this high action game but also this game where the heroes are kind of thrust into situations that they're not necessarily expecting and they kind of just have to do something very quantum leapy you know at the beginning of every episode of quantum leap like you know scott bacula like arrives in a situation and he's like in the middle of a pool game right or he's in the middle of a dance and he's just like i guess i dance i guess i play pool i guess i you know and so we wanted this sense of like yes you can choose what you do on the island but we're going to start each island with like a with a bang and that bang does a lot of things. It reveals more about the island, you know? So it, it, it tells you this problems that are there. 
it gives the players the choice of like there's the arrival always has a couple choices like do you want to do it this way do you want to do it this way it gives the players a choice of like how they're going to approach it but also because they're going to narrate their outcomes also like what that approach looks like and you can kind of start making a path towards well if you went this one way you you maybe want to keep going down that same path or maybe you go ooh no that was wrong i'm going to switch gears but you have more information so that when the trial is done and maybe you have a downbeat it's not like, okay, here goes the strife player info dumping on you, like telling you a thousand things and you picking between them. You, you already have a framework to work with. So uh, it was our crafty way of basically like exposition through conflict, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, yep. That's another challenging thing about writing islands, honestly, is creating, <clears throat> is creating arrival contests that are like, that do just that. Because uh, they're, they're just, It is, it's tricky. Uh, getting that like punchy thing that also like leads somewhere uh, and isn't yeah. just isn't just a dead end um, right and, the, and it really reflects on what's going on it's really easy to say like ah you know there's an earthquake and people are falling into it and that's great that's a great challenge but like who are the people and why is the earthquake happening and why wasn't somebody else taking care of them already and why why are they impaired? like those things kind of have to be in it too so that it has context yep um let's see um oh there was another reddit question about yeah. visual design yes oh from the rising tides hello <laughs> i saw you in chat too uh yeah john your um, visual design in your character sheets and your other elements is very neat and deliberate which i find very inspiring this is especially this is especially alongside the fact that you seem to always encourage experimentation with different settings or mechanics and new rules, and the Paragon system is no exception. My question: What tips do you have for designers who want to expand on your work in their own hack supplements, even work on their own projects, but who don't have a talent for visual design? Uh, yeah. Um... Tips. Uh... Find a visual designer you can work with, maybe. Um, but I'm being a little facetious, but but it it, it does. It well, I, I mean, it depends on what how how you work and and what your end goal is. Uh, if you're if you're making stuff um, to run in your home game group and or whatever, and like you're not making products or caring about sharing it outside your your group or whatever like obviously you do whatever you want and put it in any form that that suits you um but if it is something that is gonna you're gonna try to like give to others to use i i do think developing some some skills in that space um just just like understanding some visual design stuff is good or teaming up with someone who does who knows that stuff to help you help arrange your good ideas in a form that can be received, you know, more easily. Um, is that's, that's always, it's always a good thing uh, to, to e even if you just do it a little bit and just have like a, a diagram or put the stuff on the character sheet in the, in an order that makes sense when you create a character or just little things like that can help a lot. You don't necessarily need to go really deep into that world, but um I, I do think for game designers in general, it's good to have at least a little bit of a basis of of, of knowledge there, just um, to be able to talk to your designer or or to or to improve your the presentation of your stuff yourself. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard. It, it it's it's a big skill set, and like it it's it's hard to just say like go and learn visual design because <laughs> that's not a that's not practical uh, for most people. Um, but as someone who doesn't have any skills in visual design, um, I think there is a lot of wiggle room, especially if you're in that like I'm in development, I'm just releasing this, I'm releasing this either for free or I'm just sharing this with my friends and you're not too worried about like, this is what the final thing has to look like, but you want it to be approachable. Um, you know, I will very much milk any kind of existing um, 
any kind of existing uh, templates that I can tweak and, and adapt and move around. And they won't look as pretty as the original, but they'll at least be in a structured form that people can, uh, that, that people can work with. So, you know, I've, I've, I've hacked on blades sheets and, and on, and on agon sheets and, and like my, my design skills are infinitesimal. Um, but it's not, it's a lot easier to, you know, once you have something of a template or whatnot to work in it and it won't look finished, but it will probably look good enough so that it can be played through, you know, it, it won't look John Harper good and that's okay. It's okay if you have your thing that's, that's a little cobbled together and, um, and, uh, and, and, but I, I do think having that visual element is really key. Because if you hand somebody a Google Doc with no formatting, their eyes just glaze over. You know, it's very it's true. Yeah, yeah. Getting getting eyeballs on your work. If you if you want, you know, feedback or or people to play it or whatever, just any any kind of graphics. You know, mm -hmm. obviously that's the way of the world, right? Like that's just how marketing works. You you have some kind of imagery that that's gonna draw the eye or give people an idea of what it is or it, it inspire them to actually follow through and read it or all that yeah. kind of stuff is good. Um, and people, you know, everyone has a different threshold for, um, for that, how much they need to draw them in. Some, some people need a lot, so people don't need much. Um, uh, but Sean, Sean was talking about copying um, and template templates and stuff. And I think that's a great place to start for sure. Especially if, if you're like laying out text um, to be read in your PDF or laying out a character sheet or something, um, just straight up copying is, especially with laying out text, uh, like just like go and look at a book that you find easy to read, measure its margins and the width of its text in a number of characters and like just use those numbers uh, <laughs> because- yeah. Find the fonts they were using mm -hmm. and, or fonts that, that really speak to your, your game and yeah, yeah. Uh, almost all of that stuff is is built on these kind of old, tried and true principles. Um, and so you don't need to reinvent the wheel there. Just just copy their their type size and their margins and everything, and and use that. Um, and then you don't you don't need to like understand the principles or or anything. You can just literally copy the the stuff that works. Um, when it comes to more stylistic things and inspirational imagery and that kind of thing, it gets it gets harder to encapsulate and convey those those ideas. But um, yeah, I would not don't do not be afraid to. I mean, not literally copy. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't don't plagiarize. Don't don't. Yeah, don't but but you know what I mean. Right. Like like those the proportions and the spacing and everything. Like definitely copy that stuff. Uh, if if you find something that works, then it's it's going to work um, for you if you if you use those same those same building blocks. Uh. Uh, Sentinel Greg says Google Sheets Google Sheets make for good pseudo visual design, and I I really agree. I've played quite a few games based off of Google Sheets. Um, I know that the, with the Gauntlet community, for instance, has just a ton of Google Sheets for lots of different games, uh, so that you can sort of play the game using that instead of a, another VTT. But it also is just a uh, 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 you know, they've just taken some work to sort of structure the the, um, the the layout in such a way that it's approachable and accessible. And I think if you copy some character keepers out of someone else done in Google Sheets and you look at some of those principles of the way they color fields and the way they place things and the font sizes they use and things like that, that's also like really low hanging fruit in terms of going, oh, I could copy that Google Sheet Literally, it's just a Google Sheet. I can change everything about it and and uh, and build it too. Yeah, someone just posted one for for Agon actually on the oh, forum nice. um, at the Blades community. There's an Agon sub forum and um, there's a cool Google Sheet there, which I think is editable for Paragon stuff too. So nice. Yeah, uh, I'll put in the link to that. So I see uh, we're getting close on time. We got about 15 minutes left. Um, I can go a little bit longer, it turns out, but uh, it's up, it's up to you. Whatever. Yeah, you I'm, I'm probably gonna turn into a pumpkin. Pretty okay. Pretty close. Pretty close to five. In, in that range, I could go a little over two, but not not too much. But I did. 
I cannot figure out what's going on with Reddit. Now it appears like it's working again. Like they got my proof. Oh, okay. And like, it seems to be working. I'm kind of reticent to try and catch up because we have going for a while, but I did see, yeah, there's a question as of at least 40 minutes ago. So, um, so, you know, there's, there's a few in here that we haven't answered, so we can okay. try and try and tackle this. So Gregory, uh, sorry, Gregory Spore asked, uh, what was your design goals when making Agon? Was it a pretty solid set from the start or did it slowly come together? Uh, did either of you had favorite mechanics that didn't make the cut? Oh, we already answered the favorite mechanics that didn't make the cut, but what was our design goals? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, our design goals are really simple, I think. It was take Agon first edition. This is our initial design goals. Take Agon first edition, file all the rough edges off of it, right? And that's what we started with, and that permeated a lot in in play. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was the original charter. It was that simple. Um, after Blades, um, Fred was like, "Hey, we want to do another game with you. Um, maybe something from your back catalog, so it can be like a, a it, it'll be a simple little project uh, <laughs> instead of a whole thing. It'll just be, you know." <laughs> revise this old game and and then re and re-release it and i was like great and I, I i wasn't even going to work on it initially it was just going to be like work for hire done done um so yeah that was the initial goal but one, once we when, once we played it um it was it was clear uh that that game just you know I think we said this before, but it just, it wasn't the game that, that we were excited to play. Um, not that it was bad a game. It was just, we just weren't excited to play it. So it, the, the longer road opened up <laughs> and, um, and then, and initially it was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll start do, I'll start hammering on this thing. Um, and that didn't, it, I mean, I don't know how long that went. It, not, not, not very long, uh, and and we we had we had an early meeting in that process of like, this is going to be we're going to partner up on this one. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. it's a two this is a two person game. Uh, I'm not going to go away and 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 do this by myself. So, um, and a that, lot of that inspiration for me at least came like from working together on and playing it. Like, I think if, yeah. if either one of us had been like, okay, I'm gonna go take this and revise it, uh, it wouldn't have been half the game that it is and it would have taken five times as long, you know? Yeah. It, it just, um, we just played a lot, a lot of it. Yeah, we played a lot. And during that period, the new kind of design uh, goal opened up. Um, when, once we could see it, cause, it, cause still when we started like, thinking it was going to be like a new design we were still like well we're going to make we're just we're going to make like the better version of agon was kind of the thought um but as that started to go forward it we could kind of see like oh wait this is actually this could be a like simple starter game that the, the the fictional stuff is easy for most people to just get without a lot of, you know, explanation. Um, it's something people, most people are familiar with. And it looks like somewhere far down this road covered in broken glass uh, is a very simple game that could be easy to learn and play. And, and then that kind of, that really helped us focus on what we were doing because it was always like okay wait no like this needs to be simpler this needs to be quicker this needs to be easier to explain and like just trying to get it down to that uh, yeah that form it also really changed we also really changed our outlook about what kind of play we want to encourage you know first edition was a uh a game that uh, had a big emphasis on the competitive nature of between the characters and that was very fitting with the genre and it was a fun, it's like, it's a fun thing to, to like, be like, oh, I'm doing better, right? Like I, I like, like to challenge yourself. I mean, we play board games, we play all kinds of games that are 
that are competitive and that's really enjoyable. Um, but we realized that we really wanted to, we didn't, we didn't ever want someone at the table to be like, I'm going to sacrifice what I think would be good for this group as a group of human beings, or what I think would be good for this fiction as like our characters or any combination thereof, because the, the lure of glory was so great that they're like, no, I, I'm going to just sabotage you and, and, or, or I'm just going to fight tooth and nail, nail for it. And, and sometimes those, those characters striving against each other is like fiction. It's fantastic, but it's fantastic when the players are like vibing off of one another and really like, yeah, let's challenge each other, not sniping each other and feeling, uh, you know, really personal feeling attacked by it. And, uh, not, again, not that I feel like first edition was doing that, but we really wanted to be more explicit about trying to create an environment where it is pseudo competitive, but ultimately the heroes are working against the trouble that they're facing, the strife that they're facing. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of that came in the form of like dialing back some of the uh, different differencing, the difference between the player who is best and the player who wins and, um, and, framing more of it in the narrative outcome, like the player who's best gets to narrate the final outcome, which can be very powerful, less in the form of like, well, I get it all and you get nothing. You know, I get all the glory and you all just wasted your time. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and adding in support and other things like that, that, you know, um, gives the players the ability to really show they show their care for each other, which is, is, is nice to see. Yeah, yeah, that, that emerged through play for sure uh, as a just a thing that happened uh, wasn't mechanically like really integrated in it when it started happening in our in our group um, but once once we saw it it was like yeah this this needs to be this needs to be a focus um, yeah yeah Andy uh, just put a question in there um, uh, and you know Andy one, being one of the one of the uh, one of the players who was off on like yeah I want to you know I want to see you do that like yeah let's let's watch you this this cool character do your cool thing I don't want to steal that glory from you I want to I want to bolster that glory I want to see you be do your do your cool thing uh, so um, yeah that also that also fed into it yeah. All right. Um, huh, I think that answers the questions on Reddit. All right. Um, let's see. I think Andy's got a question for us here in chat. Um, can you speak to any emergent, perhaps unexpected themes that came forward as you all developed Agon? Perhaps more interestingly, as you all continue to develop the Paragon framework, are there themes you'd like to explore or bring forward in your design work? Huh. That's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna riff a little bit off of what we were just saying, which was um, the compassion between the characters was not initial. It was not initially a huge part of the game. It wasn't explicitly denied, but it wasn't mechanically incentivized. And uh, we found several ways in which uh, when we saw that in play, it was really rewarding. And so we wanted to incentivize it to see more of it. And I think in Agon, you can see that in the form of uh, supporting somebody to gain a bond. You can see it in the form of spending a bond to completely alleviate harm, which is kind of like the most powerful way of, one of the most powerful ways a bond can be used, which is just to like call on someone who cares about you to help you. And then after the island is over in the fellowship, where you are asking each other questions and finding out more about one another, and that's how you recover your pathos. You know, you 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 be better at humaning by being with humans, <laughs> and uh, and so I think a lot of those things, and I mean, you know, John in in Lady Blackbird, you have the sort of a similar recovery phase where you get back your dice by having a scene like that. So it's not like this was brand new tech. But I think it was new to Agon in, in the way we implemented it. And um, it really felt rewarding to, uh, to add those, to have those elements in the game of, of having the char characters you know, show compassion and care about each other. Yeah, 
Yeah, that definitely in in the in the group that Andy was in, um, you know that that was a thing that was spotlighted, and um, we were we still had achievements um, in the game at that point, and that was kind of doing some of that work. Uh, we would have that like as a group of people, uh, kind of a bonding feel going around and doing all the achievements together. Um, and and it had a knock on effect because of the people in that group, those achievements were often framed in a way that wasn't these two people in the past, like being rivals, it was them like doing a thing together. Um, and it, it I just kept coming up and it was like, oh yeah, it is, it is cool to like, and, and very thematic with our source material to have that, like that, that bond of, of companionship, um, vibe happening. And it's not just stepping over each other, uh, to, to grab the brass ring feel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, that, that it that was definitely an emergent property almost from the 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 exact people that were playing in that group um and and uh and also allison too because you know she's more than the rest of us i think was like really drawing on the source material in her in her own mind to like inform how she played her character and and like um kind of being like steeped in in the the Iliad and, and that that kind of stuff um so that those those elements of it the Achilles and uh uh Patroclus um dynamic kind of stuff you know was something that was more more highlighted and um I'm glad that we found a way to um be explicit about that in the game and and not just let it be like well you know groups will have their own dynamics and stuff like a lot of the game is kind of in that space um but yeah it became it became like a goal <laughs> to be like hey, how do we how do we have these fictional characters like care about each other and make those connections and um um yeah, I think I think for me that's probably the biggest one that came out of Agon. Uh, yeah, and we see it in other ways too. Like we reward each other legendary virtues at the end. We mm -hmm. help each other come up with the great deeds. There's a lot of like the glory of bestowing glory upon your your you know of, of your of your your companion, and um, there's a lot to say about like lifting one another up. Um, yeah. I think, um, uh, Kithid asks about PVP and, and player and finding out whether it's counterproductive. I feel like that's really following, you know, I feel, I feel like we've kind of just been talking about that in so much as saying, uh, I don't know that it was counterproductive, but it just wasn't as rewarding as a sort of a more compassionate game. Like characters being in each other's throats is great, but if there's only room for that, um, it it stops being really satisfying, and it and it can often also be um, you know uh, unpleasant. So you know, giving that shifting focus between compassion and competition was, um, uh, I think, really. Uh, I think it just made the games better quality. Honestly, it just made gameplay better. Yeah, yeah, we we wanted. We didn't want to lose that completely. Uh, I mean, there's still there is still a competition for for glory, um, but yeah, like you say, it's like first it did feel like the heroes feuding outside of Troy, um, and that's not really what we wanted for this version. Um, so we decided to shift it. It, it. It's similar. Like it depends on how you played first edition, but the first edition had that the the tension between competing like direct pvp sometimes and competing with each other um versus like needing to sort of team up to defeat the opponents like it was kind of very difficult for a single 
hero to like take down a significant enemy in in first edition so that was the way it provided that like you need to be a team uh but you're also competing um but it didn't totally work like you could make that work in first edition if you had played a bit and kind of understood how that how that dynamic was set up but um it was didn't really deliver quite right and i think a lot of groups because the pvp was really fun um the, that more like dynamic tension of of team versus individual kind of didn't happen as much i don't think um and so i think some of the people that really loved first edition loved it because they could kind of like you know it's like playing street fighter or something you could like have a game and you like play against each other and that's fun um and uh there's nothing wrong with that that it's a fun game um <laughs> but uh yeah we we i i wanted that team versus individual dynamic in first edition and i don't feel like it really hit it very well uh, so um we we wanted we definitely wanted it to hit in this version so um those dials got turned in different ways to make that happen very cool um Sentinel Greg, I hope that that also addressed your question about any other friendly ways to create more competition, like lying, taking credit. I feel like hopefully that's, I, I was trying to frame this, the, mm -hmm. those answers so that they, they address that as well. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, who do you main in Street Fighter? Ken, I'm trying to wrap up here. Uh, Chun-Li. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Guile. Uh, but um, uh, uh, yeah, this is really fun. Thanks everybody who came out. If you were in the AMA and it broke and then it worked again, um, I will go through and eventually uh, respond to all those questions. Um, hopefully they will respond to you in here. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a little juggling act and I'm not sure I did a perfect job at it, but that's okay. Uh, we, we don't need to be perfect. Um, this is a ton of fun. John, thank you so much for hanging out with me for a couple hours. Yeah, Good this was you. super, super fun. Thank you to the Agon Reddit uh, uh, management yes. <laughs> for, uh, for setting this up um, and helping us to get it through the Byzantine system of making an AMA. Um, go, go, over to, go over to the Reddit if you want to um, ask more questions and hang out and, and post stuff. Uh, there's also a Agon subforum on the Blades in the Dark community, um, and um, our Twitter handles are on the screen here uh, if you want to hit us up there. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for hanging out and asking questions and um, being curious about Agon, and we, we hope your games go well and your playsets uh, are easy to make. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> Uh, if you're on this channel for uh, actual play as well, um, we got some more games coming up next week. Um, so we'd love to see you for Burning Wheel or for uh, Rebel Crown or Court of Blades or Mothership, which is launching next week. Uh, Mad Jay is going to be running Mothership. So uh, exciting.